to the public and um, just to remind members about mobile phones and devices and all that, switching them off. Now, uh, on apologies, there are no further apologies have been received unless anybody has any to report. No? Draft minutes are included at page five. If members are content with the detail of those minutes. Great. Great. Okay. Um, chairperson's business. Now, there was, well, the table papers, I presume that's on the agenda for later on. There's a couple of three items of table. All right, great. We have an amended um, chairperson's business uh, at the end here. Uh, just to remind members, an email was issued to you earlier in the week regarding training in Microsoft OneNote and electronic, electronic committee pack update and tips. So if there's a for the committee office to arrange update training for members, those that are interested in uh, coming along, I see with <laughs> fewer and fewer of these uh, devices been used. But anyway, that's understandable. Um, now, um, the next item is teleperformance loss of uh, Samsung contract. And table today is a press article regarding concerns over the possibility of job losses at teleperformance in Newry. Um, this, this article was emailed to members by the uh, committee office. Now, I had been contacted by a party colleague, uh, Dominic Bradley, about this. Whenever, he, whenever the news broke, he was very, very concerned about what issues were emanating from it and any potential for job losses in the Newry area. Now, can I suggest that uh, with your uh, forbearance that we suggest a meeting with the Minister and or the Chief Executive of Invest NI in that at a time to be arranged. Agreed? Great. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, sorry, Chief, what uh, you're suggesting an informal meeting between yourself and the Minister? Aye, and anybody else who's, who's interested in coming along to that. Yes. <coughs> Has there been any correspondence with the Minister on it? No, this yes. has just literally hit the desk. Yesterday yeah. evening, um, so it has. Right, fair enough. Um, pardon. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> um, Northern Ireland Renewables Obligation. Uh, table today's correspondence to the Chair from BNRG Northern Power Limited regarding the NIRO. Table today are two items of correspondence which were sent to the Deputy Chair in the matter. Um, now, I also received this correspondence from a gentleman as well. He, I've, I've met him, he's a pretty competent guy at what he does. Um, he may well not have the full nuances of what a scrutiny committee is about and officials presenting before it and the, the level of scrutiny and indeed obligation that there is upon officials to respond to us. But nevertheless, um, I think the, the BNRG want to meet with the committee at some stage to explain their issues and their concerns. So are members happy enough to facilitate that at some stage? Yeah, Thank you. Chair, would that be again? Is that a formal committee meeting or an informal meeting? Um, what do you feel? What do members feel like? Just, just to say that the the uh, uh, program program is very full up mm -hmm. until yeah. the twenty seventh right. of March. What about a Tuesday? Fitting it in at lunch time or something? That would do. I will fit it in around Tuesday lunch time someday. That's good. Good idea. Now, next item then is agenda item number four, an oral briefing from Detty and Invest NI, the Northern Ireland Chamber of Commerce report on export opportunity. And uh, that's included at page 14. Sorry, did I be more today? The minutes to it? Yes. Oh, yes. Members agreed. That's okay. Um, and included we have the clerk's briefing, the briefing paper from Invest NI. An extract from the Committee Inquiry into the Operation which outlines sources of support available at the time. An assembly research briefing paper on funding available for ID, which was commissioned for the inquiry. Northern Ireland Chamber of Commerce briefing papers, which were considered by the committee at the oral briefing on the 6th of February. The table today is the Hansart transcript from that briefing. Uh, to inform members that briefing committee today are Dr. Vicky Kale, International Trade Director of Invest NI. Nigel Sands, Head of International Trade Division, Divisional Services in Best NI, Jane Murphy, Head of Detty Economic Policy Division, and Phil Rogers, Head of Detty Economic Policy Unit. So you're, you're all very welcome. Thank you for attending today. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, it's good to see you. Um, so um, we heard from some of your colleagues last week on um, 
what, what they were saying, so I uh, anticipate hearing some, some detail from yourselves today. So the, the format is, and I'm sure you've been told by your other colleague there, the, the Dello, that you have up to 10 minutes to present, and then we have question and answer session from colleagues. I know some of you have been here before, but just to um, maybe see, season the hands in front of a committee. So um, uh, please continue. OK. Thank you, Chair. And uh, with your permission, uh, I'll start and say a few words uh, at the departmental level before we'll passing over to, to Vicky. And she will go into some of the things that Invest and I are, uh, do in relation to, to trade. Um, I suppose that at the highest level we have the programme for government. It identifies growing the economy as our number one <coughs> priority, and the economic strategy prioritises um, exporting export-led growth as the means of improving our growth and competitiveness here in Northern Ireland. In terms of supporting exports, it's export-led growth through raising productivity by encouraging investment in skills, in R&D, in innovation, and encouraging local firms to enter new markets. Um, the economic strategy set out a number of commitments in relation to diversifying and deepening our exports, and you know, three of the highlights of those would be obviously the, the PFG target around increasing manufacturing exports by 20 per cent, the corresponding target in relation to emerging economies where there's a 60 per cent target, and the commitment to develop uh, an agri-food strategy to boost exports from that sector by, by 2020. You'll be well aware that uh, in relation to some of those things, in particular the programme for government target for the 20 per cent increase is not on track to be met at the moment. And in particular, 2012-13 um, was a year in which um, the progress in that was very, very tough and linked primarily to the, the downturn in the Republic of Ireland and the Eurozone, which account for a, a very large proportion of our, of our exports. And while there was improved performance since then, in 2012-13, it it's, would be difficult to predict that the extent of the recovery since then will make up for that lost ground during that 2012-13 period. Outside of the target, external sales to, to GB were actually re relatively strong during that 12-13 period, but of course, while still useful sales and still good for Northern Ireland, they're not necessarily captured within that target. So that has, of course, led to a greater focus on exports, and the Northern Ireland Economic Strategy sets out that, uh, if I can quote, uh, the strategy will also be underpinned by relevant strategies and related action plans to progress each of the executive's <coughs> economic priorities. And there is a proposal that uh, DETI and Invest in I and working with others will produce an action plan that will take together a number of strands of work which are coming to fruition and produce an action plan to support um, exports going forward, you know, not just for the rest of the, this PFG period. It's probably going to be more orientated towards the next programme for government period in that action and exports has a certain timeline. I'm sure, as Vicky will, will, will talk about later, uh, exports don't happen overnight for a company. They tend to involve a lot of time and effort. And so support and help the companies now won't bear fruit in terms of exports and sales, maybe for a couple of years. And in relation to that plan, you know, there are a lot of things coming to fruition. And certainly the, the report produced by the Northern Ireland Chamber of Commerce, we absolutely welcome that. Uh, any new ideas and suggestions are always welcome and will be absolutely looked at seriously in terms of putting together that action plan. And at that point, I'm happy to hand over to Vicky, who will say a bit more about Invest NIA's activities and programmes on the ground. 
Thanks, Shane. Chairman, committee members, um, what I'd, I'd like to do is just make you aware of some of the activities that we're undertaking in relation to helping Northern Ireland exports. Uh, you've all got a, a copy of the presentation that was sent through, so what I'll do is, is base um, the, the comments I make around that, but I'll not go into every slide in detail. And uh, during that, I think we'll pick up, as was highlighted by the Chamber's report, uh, like many regions of the United Kingdom, we do face a number of challenges in growing our exports. We are a small regional economy in a post-recession environment, uh, and that has added uh, in some ways to the challenges that we face. If I can draw your attention just to the, the uh, first slide, which is the map of the world. And in relation to the map of the world, uh, you'll see that it's split into four. There are four different colours. And what we've done is divided the map uh, into four territories. And then we have, have different teams, different people responsible for each territory. But you'll also see on that uh, particular slide the offices and locations that we have across the globe. We have 18 locations in all. In addition to that, we have in-market advisors and a further nine locations that we can use to help Northern Ireland companies penetrate those markets. But we also have access to UKTI advisors and we also have access to Enterprise Ireland advisors through a memorandum of understanding <coughs> that has been signed. So through these uh, in-market resources we have, we're able to utilise them to deliver trade missions uh, for companies and again I think as, as part of the, the notes you, you received uh, the programme of events that we run on an annual basis. Um, we also have an attendance at major exhibitions which are internationally renowned and gives our companies a chance to showcase their products and offerings and we also develop tailored support for specific companies to allow them to penetrate markets, uh, niche markets, in relation to uh, their expertise and offerings that they have. In terms of what we offer companies, we effectively divide it into four broad categories, and I'm not going to go into detail about each of them, but you'll see from your notes we help companies in relation to market intelligence and sector knowledge, so they get a strategic overview of what the opportunities are on a global basis, and then can identify which ones to actually focus on and try and penetrate. We help them understand the opportunity through market research, both carried out here in Northern Ireland, but also carried out in market. <coughs> we help them develop the skills and the expertise and the know-how that they need through capability, capability development actions, which can be through one-to-one -one advisory support, or it can be through workshops and mentoring. We help them get into the markets through means of trade missions, exhibitions, specialised visits to the markets, and then we can help them penetrate the market deeper using that resource that we have in market to help them penetrate the opportunities. As I say, in your packs there, there's details of um, each of those sections and the financial contributions that we give companies in relation to them, um, but I'm not going to go into detail in relation to that. Um, we do offer some support in relation to Northern Ireland companies that is not available in England, Scotland, Wales or indeed in the Republic of Ireland, such as translation support and also support for legal advice for, them, uh, for companies looking at export contracts. Um, in relation to the, the um, importance of the different uh, countries in relation to exports, um, the second slide that you, you have uh, is, is a block diagram which shows um, pictorially uh, the, the importance of different markets. And you'll see that uh, from that diagram on the right hand side there are a number of what we would term emerging markets. And those are markets that are increasing in terms of importance in relation to uh, our exports. On the right hand side you'll see that the Republic of Ireland is a very important uh, market for, for our companies in relation to exports. It's very often a starter market for Northern Ireland companies because it's easy to get to across the border. Um, so they are important markets, but so too is GB, which obviously doesn't show up in export figures, but we know a number of our companies transferred their focus from ROI during economic recession to GB, especially construction, and we have acted accordingly to help them access contracts that are available within GB in that particular area. Before I, I move away from the importance of the different markets in relation to export, I'd just like to mention one aspect that's worth bearing in mind when you look at these, this information. We use HMRC figures to determine what our exports from Northern Ireland are to the relevant markets. They actually record in terms of point of disembarkation 
not necessarily destination. So if we are going to actually ship goods out from the Republic of Ireland, it will be shown as an export to the Republic of Ireland, even though their ultimate destination could be Dubai or South Africa or America. So that's just one thing to remember whenever you're looking at that information. So Northern Ireland you know, has important links with the Republic of Ireland and it is an important export market. But in, included in that figure that you see, it could be uh, some uh, sales relating to this, what's termed the Rotterdam effect. Uh, so it's just something worth bearing in mind. And that obviously can happen in relation to GB, because some companies may ship goods to GB, so it wouldn't show up as exports, and then it's shipped on from there. So just something to bear in mind. Uh, if I can skip through the detail of how we help companies uh, and ask you to, to move through to um, a slide. I apologise the slides aren't numbered, so apologies for that. But um, you, you'll find that there's, there's a slide which has got Europe and Russia at the head of it, and it's got a pie diagram in it. Uh, and uh, this shows, and again, we do this for each of the four territories. I'll talk about Europe and Russia, but we replicate it for each of the territories. Um, we, we look at, at the opportunities in a particular market. So we analyse the trends in terms of growth uh, in relation to the market. We look at the, the um, opportunities that exist in that market, and then we relate it back to Northern Ireland expertise, because obviously there are potential opportunities in every market, but not all of them suit Northern Ireland ex experience and expertise and what our Northern Ireland companies have to offer. So using this intelligence, we will then drill into key markets within a particular territory that are, will be important to Northern Ireland. And if you move to the next slide, you'll see that it's entitled Europe and Re Russia Market Focus. It shows what we have uh, analysed and determined to be the primary and secondary markets within that territory. So those are the markets we will put more focus on. Although there may be opportunities in other markets, they aren't as good a fit for Northern Ireland companies. So our focus goes on these uh, primary and then the secondary markets, which we'll be bringing in to, to a primary status over the next coming years. And then if you go to the next page, you'll see it's entitled Europe and Russia Sector Focus. We are then able to analyse those markets and say, so what are the key sectors for those markets? So rather than taking a scattergun approach in terms of where could we bring Northern Ireland companies to, we're drilling down to identify those markets where it's best putting the focus and those sectors that it is best aligning to those markets. So we bring the two together uh, and that is what dictates our international programme and where we, we take companies to. And as I say, that's repeated for each of the four territories. I'm not going to go into detail uh, for each of the territories, but you have the information in the packs in front of you. Uh, so if I could ask you just to, to flip to uh, the second last slide, um, and if I could just uh, summarise uh, some of the impact that we, we've had so in terms of recent successes, and as I say, this is on the second last slide that you have, uh, in terms of Europe and Russia, uh, in Russia, Andor have uh, been awarded a contract for a quarter of a million pounds. Uh, uh, that were two contracts which were awarded last July, and that's supplying scientific cameras to leading research institutes in Moscow. In relation to Asia Pacific and indeed Tal uh, Indonesia, Talis uh, has had a major contract with, awarded with the Indian Indonesian Ministry of Defence. And actually, uh, last week, whenever Minister Foster was leading the trade mission, she got the opportunity to meet the Indo Indonesian Defence Minister uh, in Jakarta to thank him for choosing Talis and, and help build the relationship, which is so important in that particular market. Uh, in terms of the Americas, if we look at Mexico, FM Environmental uh, have uh, sales there based on three quarter of a million pounds. And that's in relation to its grease removal water treatment system, uh, which it is now supplying into Walmart. And it's supplying into 200 stores across Mexico. And then uh, I've got South Africa Edge Innovate have uh, got a £2 million deal for recycling equipment uh, to a distributor in Johannesburg. And something that isn't on the slide, but I think it's worth uh, mentioning, based on what happened last week, obviously uh, Singapore is an important market for right bus, and right bus are supplying in 1,000 buses uh, by 2015. Uh, to Singapore, and certainly I know the party that were out in Singapore last week noticed the number of right bus buses 
on the Singapore streets, which is which is great to see. So there there are successes, and, and some of those are the, the major successes. We have we have other successes relating to smaller companies, because it's important that we're bringing all of the companies through uh, to uh, really maximise export opportunity. But the last slide really focuses on some of the challenges that exist. And some of that relates to uh, getting access to the relevant data. I've mentioned some of the nuances with the HMRC data that we just need to be aware of. GB obviously is an important market to us, uh, which we class as external sales, but just getting information regarding that uh, is difficult because obviously it's not recorded through HMRC, so we're working uh, with our colleagues in, in order to get mechanisms to allow us to, to actually tease that out. Service-based exports. The service industry is a very important part of the Northern Ireland economy, but obviously HMRC looks at products that are shipped, so it doesn't give us any measure of service exports. So again, that is something that we're, we're working with our colleagues to, to try and get that information. But the key thing is the number of companies exporting, uh, and I think you know, everybody would agree that we need more companies to export. This is a challenge that we face in Northern Ireland. It's also faced in England, Wales and Scotland, and in fact all of the regions have recorded a drop in the number of exporters over recent years, and we need to increase that and bring more companies into that export pool. And we will continue to work with partners um, such as the, the Chamber, Councils, Industry of <coughs> Ireland, to, to deliver a continuum of support for companies. And what we need to do in that continuum is make it easy for companies to know where to go to, to get help. Uh, and that's an important element of what we need to do going forward. Mm. So we, we are making inroads, but uh, you know, there's more things that we need to do. Okay, thanks very much for that. Just in relation to the, the PFG targets, um, <clears throat> one of the things that has consistently come up here at this committee has been energy costs. <coughs> and just to quote, the 10 companies which account for 50% of exports are, by their very nature, large energy users. And say Bombardier, Michelin, those types of companies. Now, say for example one of those companies must leave the north here, citing, as indeed some of them have done the pressures they are under, the energy costs that, that they have. What impact would that have on the export figures that you are presenting to us ourselves here? And indeed, based on that, what do you feel that could be done or should be done to alleviate the energy costs issues for those uh, big companies? Can I start off with? Okay. Okay. Yep. I mean, in terms of the impact on the export figures, it would have a significant impact. Um, it is evident in relation to the, the export figures, uh, if, if one of the larger exporters have a little hiccup, there is an immediate huge impact in terms of the HMRC information that is presented. So there is no doubt it would have a, a, a big impact in relation to Northern Ireland exports. Um, in relation to uh, addressing that, I, I know, and, and I will not get into detail because it is not an area that uh, I, I have worked in, but I know within Invest Northern Ireland there are steps have been taken to try and help companies improve efficiencies in relation to utilisation of fuel and energy uh, and, and collaboration with the universities. But I suppose in terms of, of more detail in relation to that, I will hand to Shane. Yeah, well, I am not sure how much further I can go. Energy is not uh, 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 under my remit in the department. Maybe I'd say thankfully. Um, I, I, you know, obviously, the regulator has published some information around about a year ago, which highlighted the, the differential between um, the costs faced by large users and those faced by you know, similar sorts of companies in in other parts of of Europe. And as Vicky said, if if some of our largest companies left, not, not only is there an impact potentially in exports and, you know, and quite significant impact, there's obviously you know, consequences for employment and so forth, and the extent to which those are concentrated in some areas, the impacts go, 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 go much wider. Um, I'm not sure if I can answer your question as to what the department could do. I'm not the best person to do that. Um, Just we, we could seek some input from others in the department, better placed to understand what the work from the regulator might, might come out with. The observation is that it has been raised as quite a significant concern with us by some of the major players here. And 
I'm sure somebody somewhere in the department has considered it. A wee bit surprised that between yourselves and Investi and I, there hasn't been some sort of a, a confab around this and see what mitigation or other measures could be put in place to, one, retain uh, these big companies and, two, make sure that it isn't seen as too major an obstacle to further investment from overseas, from FDIs, if they're coming. But anyway, <coughs> obviously, you're I, not I think just to, I think just, to, just to be clear, I'm not suggesting necessarily there hasn't been anything done. I'm suggesting that we're probably not the best people right. to, to answer oh, that right. question. Well, can you make sure that um, we have a briefing or some details provided to the committee around what, what thoughts or what ideas are being considered by the oh, department? Absolutely. We, this, we, we, we can take that back to the department. Okay, thank you. Um, move on to Mr Dunn. Gordon. Thanks very much, Chair, and thanks folks for coming in today, and we appreciate your, your efforts. In relation <coughs> to the plan for exports, uh, the Chamber of Commerce made great play at the meeting we had a week or two ago about the fact that the department didn't have a plan for exports. What, what's your uh, response to that? And has is Daddy in the process of drafting up such a plan, or are you aware of such? Um, okay, we absolutely um, have plans to do an export action plan. Um, if I can sort of touch on that for uh, a second, um, there was uh, through the Northern Ireland economic strategy. That, that statement that I read out earlier, which indicated that we had plans to do strategies and action plans in a number of key areas, and you know we did have the option of taking something in action on exports through within a wider enterprise strategy, which was to follow on from a corporation tax decision. Now, with the corporation tax decision having been deferred, the call was made that we should take forward an action plan on priority areas which couldn't wait for a corporation tax decision to, to remove some of the uncertainty with the landscape. And one of those areas is, um, as I say, exports. We have a number of pieces of work which are coming together, which are going to inform that. And to give you a, a flavour, these include... Um, no, there's planned improvements in measurement by both NISRA and indeed some work that we're doing internally within DETI. We have research which is now coming to a head this month on target markets for Northern Ireland business and what might be the market entry strategies for the 10 best opportunities across the world. We have also at our disposal recently published research by Intertrade Ireland on um, analysis of the key features of exporting SMEs on the island. Um, we also have an evaluation and business case in relation to existing Invest in I activities and programmes. And now we have uh, uh, another piece of evidence from the, the Chamber of Commerce, which we want to feed in as well. So all of these pieces of work are going to feed into the plan. To, to, to the plan. I don't know, Vicky, that list isn't necessarily exhaustive, and I don't know if Vicky wants to add anything to that. Certainly, I mean, we have been uh, looking at, at how we, we deal with companies. I mentioned you know, the fact that we have split the world into four territories and that we're progressing in, in relation to those and identifying the primary and secondary markets. Uh, so we have got, I suppose, more uh, intelligence coming through and, and we have strategies for each of those territories and for each of the sectors which again will feed into this overall plan. Uh, we also provide support for potential exporters as to how we can get them in and, and actually uh, operating on an international basis. So we, we have been working and, and doing um, these uh, I suppose Lower, lower strategic type activities that then feed into the overall strategy. So certainly there's been a lot of progress made in terms of building blocks that can then feed together. And as uh, Shane has mentioned, you know, the evidence mm -hmm. uh, that we're getting from the different sources is helpful in relation to that. So is there very much a two-way process between yourself and the Chamber? Has there been? 
We, we interact with the Chamber on a regular basis, and I think the last time we presented our strategy to the, the Chamber was have been in October last year. Um, we're actually uh, in progress with the, the Northern Ireland Chamber of putting in place a regional coordinator, and this is part of the UK British Chamber initiative, which is underway, where they are putting nine regional coordinators in the UK, in, gee, well, in England, and then they have offered one regional coordinator per uh, devolved administration. So we have been working with the Northern Ireland Chamber in terms of, of putting that resource in place, which would act then as a conduit between the Chamber and Invest Northern Ireland in terms of feeding those, those companies through to deliver the right type of support support for them at the right stage of development. Who is supporting the coordinator? Sorry. Uh, UKTI. UK, so yeah. UKTI and uh, British Chamber. It's a joint initiative. They are funded. So UKTI are funding the right. regional good. coordinator. That's good. Now, just leading on a couple of other points, Chair. Um, the, the vast majority of uh, businesses within Northern Ireland are SMEs, as we all know. Right, okay. And the tendency is that a lot of them don't export for various reasons. The main reason they're busy. The very busy people doing the day job and they don't have a lot of resources to, to organise themselves and to look at other markets. What more can be done to, uh, to try and get SMEs uh, looking outside the box and trying to, to broaden their, spread their net as it is? Um, obviously, ten companies within Northern Ireland understand uh, account for about 50 per cent of exports, probably a number of them you've already mentioned there in your presentation, and we certainly commend the good work you've done working with those. But just on that, you know, how can you see SMEs, and we hear a lot about SMEs and the need to support them, and R&D funding, etc., etc., but what more can be done to try and increase their, their uptake on, on exports? Just before you answer that, um, I know Mrs Overend here had wanted to come in, so on the back of that, Gordon, yeah. I, I'll bring Sandra in here too because we, we had uh, outlined this would be her area. So Mrs Overend will ask her questions then for yourselves to, to respond after that, OK? That's fine. Gordon, I know you're very interested in it as well, obviously, but <laughs> uh, it, it, is, it is a big concern. It was one of the issues I'd raised with the Chamber of Commerce last, last week. Um, you know, and it's... Is it? I mean, I know it's it's probably easy for the big companies to uh, to export, and it's one of those you've got you've built up a rapport with those companies, and you can c keep on continuing to help them. But maybe they can cope by themselves for a while. And how do you reach out to the SMEs and get them to think about exporting? Um, because there are so many small companies I know in Mid Ulster. Um, there, there's companies who are exporting uh, flowers worldwide, and you know they're just in the middle of nowhere in, in middle sir. It's, but it's getting to getting to those we SMEs and getting them to realise that maybe other people could do with the, what they're making. How do you how do you reach out to those? Um, um, just before you answer that, um, I put I personally put some and. Uh, Sammy wants to come in on the back Thank of that. Just, just very quickly, uh, I'm in the um, exports Republic of Ireland, so could you maybe um, tell us about your uh, support for SMEs to the Republic of Ireland? Okay. And <laughs> on that, just one <laughs> final thing, <laughs> and this is on the back of evidence that we received too, to tend to get a confluence of issues and target all this stuff so that we're not having multiple questions and multiple answers from yourselves and the efficiency of the working of the committee. Um, we did hear from one of the members who was with us here who had a business and a um, major issue for him was to get tape, difficulties with export, seeing his way through all that, support with, in fact, the paperwork that's required, the multiplicities of paperwork that's required. So if I could just come in on the back of everything that has been said by uh, Mr Dunn and Mrs Overend and we hear from you just how, how in fact, that's... Uh, Working way through, through as well. okay. Okay, if, if I'll, I'll try and address it as a, as a composite, because uh, I think there, there are different uh -huh. things that, that uh, need to be done in order to attract new exporters into the arena. And I think you, you're right in, in terms of getting companies to actually realise that they can do it. Uh, it's, it's a big challenge. And what we have found is very useful and very helpful in that is case studies. So if it's actually their peers 
who are describing what they have done and the success they have had, uh, that certainly has a, has a very influ influential impact on them. And the, the recent campaign that uh, we've, we've run, and it was originally under the, the Bisting Business brand, and, and then it has progressed, uh, we then set up a ded dedicated helpline uh, for companies. And we find that that was a good way for companies to, to realise that it is <coughs> possible for small companies to be successful in uh, the international marketplace and we got quite a lot of calls coming through in relation to that but we still need to keep on uh, ensuring that people get the message and we run doing business seminars for example we had 11 european advisors in northern ireland in the one place uh, about three weeks ago uh, in Temple Patrick. We had companies there to hear about the opportunities and, and we present very much warts and all. You know, it's a real uh, picture that is presented to companies in terms of opportunities, but things they need to think of. And the companies were then able to have one-to-one -one engagement with advisors from relevant markets and were then following up with them. Um, so we have a number of ways in which we can try and get the message out in terms of opportunities and help people realise they can do it too. Um, we need to be, in, ter in terms of, of Northern Ireland, I think we need to look where we can perhaps join a number of the events that happen to, to try and promote exports to companies, because I think what can happen is we can have so many events that companies don't know which ones to go to, and it dilutes the message that goes out. So I, th I think we, you know, as, as a totality, all the partners who are, are looking at the export, you know, we, we need to look at how we can work better together in terms of getting that message across and, and really giving the right focus to events. In relation to um, then taking companies into the uh, international marketplace, I mentioned ROI very often is the first port of call for companies whenever they're, they're looking uh, at exporting. And we have been running with Intertrade Ireland and Enterprise Ireland for a number of years, Acumen. Um, it's a programme where there is 50% funding given to the company either to help with market research or actually to put a salesperson in situ in the company. So you mentioned resource and time is a very important thing with companies to actually uh, be successful in relation to, uh, to, to exporting. And this is a way that they can get additional resource at a very favourable cost, because 50% of the costs are being, as I say, are being met. Also, help is given in, in, in terms of actually defining what they want that person to do. And as I say, we've been working with uh, Intertrade Ireland uh, for a number of years in relation to that. Um, and we, we certainly find that that is a, a way to get companies on board and being able to, to take that first step. But again, we need to keep getting that message out. Companies need to know that that support's there and available to them. Um, in relation to Acumen, I think to say that uh, most recent figures, which brings us to January this year, 43 businesses have received £300,000 worth of support in relation to that particular area. We also work on the food side again. We have a lot of food companies who would look to ROI for, for uh, markets. So we have food advisors in situ that will help companies get in to talk to some of the buyers in the larger multiples. And this gives them access that they wouldn't get on their own. So we are able to open the doors for those large multiples and get them in uh, so that they, they have a chance of selling into it. Um, and we also do that as well in GB. I know it's not an export market, but it's very often a starter market for people moving outside of Northern Ireland. And again, we have food advisors who can open the doors for the multiples to the Tesco's, to the Sainsbury's, to the Harrods, to get companies in and in front of, of key buyers. Um, we also have a specific help targeted toward companies taking those first steps. We have a programme which we've been running uh, for a number of years now called Going Dutch. And that is where we really put our arms around the companies. We, uh, first of all, in ensure that they've got the right offering for the Dutch market. We help them develop it if it's not where it needs to be. We help them develop their sales pitch, their USP, their marketing material. We, they, they work in a, in, a, in a group. I mean, they've all got their individual plans and we take them through that, but they're also able to coach each other as part of it and critique each other. So they get that learning from each other as well and build the confidence. We then arrange meeting schedules for them, take them out to the market, accompany them to the meetings if needs be. Uh, we debrief them in market after they've had the meetings. When they come back to Belfast, we ensure they do the follow-up, which is so vital because what happens is a lot of companies, whenever they get from, come back to, to Northern Ireland, they just get back into business as usual and forget the, the links. So we ensure that they do the follow-up they have an action plan, they proceed and they work through that action plan. Uh, and in, in relation to going Dutch, I think we've generated £200 million 
£1,000 worth of business for Northern Ireland companies going through that particular programme. So we do try and, and give the right support to companies at the right time, but getting companies to, in that mindset where they believe they can export is something we still and we all have a role to play in relation to that. that that's very important, and the context of this is the research, all the research indicates, and I'll, just to quote from the, the Intertrade research on this, um, the key factor determining if a company will export is the drive and aspiration of the key decision makers in the business. So all of that is directed towards giving folks a bit, a bit like your, your example, where um, you know, there was ne no necessarily rhyme or reason why a very small company in a very remote place was doing exports, and there's probably much bigger companies that are doing a lot less of it, or maybe none of it at all. And so much of it depends on the 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 managing director, the CEO, the owner, and their drive and ambition to do that. And those sorts of activities help showcase that others can do it, and if others can do it, you can do it. Absolutely. And so the one thing I didn't mention was the red tape. I think someone mentioned yes. the red tape and the impact that can have. Um, the, each market will have its own requirements in relation to the documentation that's required. Uh, we can certainly have, and do advise companies in terms of the requirements for each of the markets. There are others who are experts in relation to export documentation, and indeed the Northern Ireland Chamber is one such body that provides uh, export documentation for Northern Ireland companies whenever they export. Um, and we also, as I mentioned before, we provide legal uh, support, so up to £10,000 worth of support to companies per annum to get advice in relation to legal contracts uh, for export markets. Because is that a licence issue as well? Licence issues can often be a problem that brings in extra costs, you need extra fees involved. Is there support for that? In, in, in terms of, of the legal uh, support yeah, that we have, yeah. again, that, that can be used to, to help in relation yeah. to that, because you know, we, we realise that can be hard <coughs> for companies yeah. taking first steps. OK. Um, Mrs Overend, back again. We're Thank you, Chair. Um, we could have the, the answers as concise as sharp as possible just to the questions. <laughs> OK, thank you. Just two separate um, follow-up questions. How, how does Invest Northern Ireland measure its additionality regarding support for exports? And, and then my other question is, uh, you mentioned that you were happy to, to work towards building a new action plan. What would you do differently? <coughs> okay. Uh, in terms of, of the additionality, it, it's a difficult thing to measure. Um, what we, we do is evaluation in terms of the support that we give companies, and, and we get the feedback from companies. One thing that we've been focusing in on to try and get some sort of um, evidence in relation to this is questioning the company about the, the, stra the uh, strategic benefit they have achieved from the support given. <coughs> So we ask them to, to actually tell us about the strategic benefits. So what, would, what are they able to do, or what have they done that they would not have otherwise have done? So that's one way that we can we can try and measure that. But you know, we're aware, and as Shana said, we can work with the company, and it could be two years before they get the contract. So it's very hard to have that one to one. So we are uh, ensuring that we get that feedback from companies to ensure that we are influencing their their action future and, and helping them do things they couldn't otherwise do. Okay. Um, in relation to the new action plan in terms of what we would do different. Um, certainly we, we have been taking steps and really over the last 18 months we, we have been on a journey which we are not at the end of yet. So I, I would say that as we, we build the action plan uh, collectively there may be tweaks that we may, need to make in terms of what we're doing mm. or it may influence you know, the direction that we take some of the things we've started. So I, I'm not sitting here saying well I would do this, this, this differently but what, we, we're in a, a situation where we're, we're well, very willing to take on board suggestions and evidence from other uh, streams that we can then build in to how we progress and, and continue to develop. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Chair. thanks for that. Um, Mr Agnew, Stephen. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your information so far. <clears throat> I'd like to come to the, the sports around R&D and innovation. Um, I, I don't know how much you, 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 you followed of our, our briefing last week from the Northern Ireland Chamber of Commerce, but we got very interesting evidence from Richard Bell from uh, Somatics. It, it sort of was suggested to me, and in fact we went back and looked at some of our own research when we did uh, our inquiry in the R&D. There seems to be a lot 
of sources of funding, which I suppose on the surface sounds like a, a good thing to support with R&D. It's great that th those are available, but when I asked uh, Mr. Bell to, to list some of the ones he'd looked at, he said, I'd be here too long. And he said also, as a company, if I'm going out to seek them, I'll be there too long. Um, is, is any work being done to try and pull some of those funding streams together? Okay. Um, certainly, there are a large number of uh, support streams for innovation in general. Mm -hmm. um, there's a suite of Invest in I interventions again. Well, I'm not the best person to speak to about individual ones, but certainly there are different ones to targeted at different types of companies on their innovation journey. Um, and so they have a suite of programs. You have activities and support from universities, from FE colleges, from the likes of the folks down at the Science Park. You have lots of companies. You have some companies that work together, some companies that, that, that work with um, so innovation providers in, in other parts of um, Europe. The landscape is complicated, and this is this is one of the reasons why we're considering within the innovation strategy. Uh, I think the the term is uh, an open innovation resource. The landscape is complicated, and if there was someone, if there was a, a group of providers, probably quite small out there, who could help business navigate <coughs> complex landscape, very good at it. We see that as a potential way of uh, of making it a bit simpler mm -hmm. companies to to link up they've got an innovation problem they want to solve it may not be a, a big r d problem it may be a design problem it may be a, a business model they want to re-engineer there could be lots of things that that they have someone to go to to take them independently to to the best <coughs> folks that can help solve their problem um, i think the, Absolutely, except the landscape is, is complicated and it's probably not apparent to us in Detty how we alone could simplify the landscape because there are so many actors from so many different parts of Northern Ireland with lots of links to lots of different departments and certain degrees of independence. It's you know, practical solutions to make it into one nice one-stop shop didn't really seem like an endeavour which would practically be doable within any reasonable timescale. I take your point, and I mean, I looked at some of the, the, the funding streams last night, and they certainly are di diverse across how they're funded, who they're funded by. There's, there's public sector, there's private sector, there's EU. Um, but when all they're trying to achieve the same goal, is it not worth trying, particularly where they're departmental funding, you know, getting Dell, Dard, Daddy together, start looking at some of the things funded and saying, can we not pull some funds here? And um, we're all trying to achieve the same things. Um, is that is that not something that would be achievable, certainly in the short to medium term? Again, that's just something. So we we are looking at, mm -hmm. and certainly it's it's not just funding sources. It is also source of of help and innovation. Um, sure. Some companies don't necessarily need a pot of money to do some research. They need somebody with the ideas to solve their problem. Mm -hmm. And so, well, with respect to, to Vicky and her, her friends, uh, and Invest and I, going to Invest and I for a pot of money to do something, or going to Dard for a pot of money to solve a problem, isn't necessarily the best solution. But in many cases, the solution will be. Accessing the, pers the person with the, the brain power, with the experience, with the contacts, that can solve the problem. Maybe that problem would have been solved in a different sector, for a different reason. And so, I, I'm, I don't think we'd be convinced that just putting funding together is, is the solution, because R&D is only one component and you know, not a major component of innovation. And certainly, the innovation landscape 
is extremely complex, and as I indicated before, it, it is something we are exercised about, and we would like mm. to put in place something which helps firms navigate through that maze. Well, I'll, I'll take that point, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to it, that, that it is more about funding, but sticking to the funding just for a <coughs> second longer, um, what we got uh, last week was little drips here and there do not do it for me as the owner of a small business. And that's how it was seen, that there are lots of little pots, um, which is helpful up to a point. Um, but if you're past that point, it's of no help at all, particularly if you have to spend a lot of time and resources trying to find the right pot for you. So to some extent, the, the, the customer is always right, and the customer is telling us it's not working for them. Or this particular customer, in any case. Yeah. I, again, I, I can't understand that, and um, certainly some of the pots okay. are are quite significant. And, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I don't know the R and D figures with, within Invest and I off the top of my head, but you know it's probably not far off the scale of selective financial assistance in terms of quantities of expenditure. You know, grant for R and D is you know, would be very close to being probably the, the top or second top spending programme within an investor. So some of the pots are very, very significant. But I, I do appreciate that if someone from a company has a problem and they want to find someone to solve that problem, it can be a difficult challenge getting to the right person as opposed to getting to a person. Okay. Um, moving on then, sort of except where we are. I mean, it, it, quickly, Steve. Okay, it has been this committee's opinion that we do need to pull together those funding streams and that's been put through our inquiry report. But coming to the, the situation as it is, um, I asked when when you go to invest in I, are you guided through some of these processes, the kind of hand-holding, the, the non-financial side of it, just the resource, and I was told, you know, you have to go out and look for them yourself. Is that, would that be how it is from invest in I's point of view? Why, why is, it, is it that way? That if, Well, uh, in terms of an easy point of contact. I mentioned the 0800 number mm -hmm. uh, that, that is in, in situ now. And we have a business support team which will field the calls that come in from that. What they do whenever they receive a call is try and ascertain what is the issue that the, the customer on the other end of the line wants to, to try and resolve. And they will take the actions to try and put them in contact with the right person. That right person may not be within Invest Northern Ireland. It may be that the right mechanism of support lies outside. So they have regular updates in terms of the full suite of support that's available within Northern Ireland, which is difficult because things, you know, in terms of when you think of what can happen in council areas or economic development agencies, things come, things go. But they get regular updates in terms of the full suite that's uh, available. So they will endeavour to, to connect that person to, to the right area. Uh, if it's within Invest Northern Ireland, then a referral would be made to the area, appropriate area within Invest Northern Ireland. And I'm conscious just we certainly mm. receive a lot of, of inquiries coming through that matter and we it, pick them up. If it's not within Invest in I, is that person then they're off your books? You know, I know you're saying they're sending regular updates, but it, it, it seems to me what it is a hand-holding exercise. The two parts of it, it's the, the funding, which we, we, we touched on, and then the, the hand-holding through the process. If you're moving about from place to place, you're not getting necessarily... And the sense we got, you get the hand holding at the start, but then you get to a point where you're blocking and there's no one there. Uh, does Invest and I make any effort to try and take the person on the whole journey, whether they're the ones given the financial support? Does Invest and I give that hand holding support from from almost design or whatever the early stages to go on the market? There's a sense that they get help at the start. They get help with going to market, but there's a lot in the middle where they're they're on their own. Uh, so if, if I can just put in the, into a bit of perspective, uh, the business support line receives um, just under a thousand inquiries a month in relation to that which they're fielding. Now that is in addition to companies who are already engaging with Invest Northern Ireland and have an account manager through the means of the client executive client manager, which they're being routed through that way. Um, Certainly, in relation to the help that's given at the start with the companies, um, the company would then, whenever, whenever that particular stage is finished, the next stage would be discussed with the company. But very often, it's up to the company 
to decide to take that next stage. And what we you know, can find is that companies get to a certain point and then they don't come back or they don't take the next step to follow up in relation to it. But they would never just we wouldn't just stop, get to a point where we say, well, that's it, fine. There would be a mapped out next stage mm -hmm. with the company. But you know, the company needs to take the steps in the next stage. Is there a problem, and this is my final question, Sharon, it's a very brief one. Um, um, is, is there a problem that Invest in I is helping too many people, too little? We have different types of support for different people. Um, and you know, we're very conscious that in terms of, of the larger business base, we, we have a lot of what we would term one-to-many events. And then as people progress through the, their journey and through their development and sophistication, we, we get into different types of support. So it's not as though everybody's getting the same support. It's not a one-size-fits-all by any means. And there are differing approaches taken for the different categories of, of companies based on their stage of development. OK, thank you. Okay, thanks. thanks. But just coming in on the back of that, um, we've heard how disparate uh, funding and indeed other resource sources can be. But can I just put something to you? Um, when we had the Northern Ireland Consumer Council with us, they said they believed that the Republic is ahead because they have an export cult that everyone buys into from top to bottom. And just a quote from what they said, there is a continuum and a joined up thinking. All departments know their place and everybody all the way up to the Taoiseach knows that it is that that's the number one priority. Therefore, if an Irish company needs help in the export market, needs an obstacle removed or needs that road or the road unblocked, it seems to me that everyone swings in with support all the way to the top. That's where we should be, and we're not there yet. Have you any comment to make on that? Because I'll well, explain to you why. Um, since our meeting, some of your colleagues were up last week, and we touched on Horizon 2020 with them and the likes of that, but we're not going there because that's not your field here today. Um, but subsequent to that, I, I did meet with a business person, and I, I asked him specifically around support and measures on export, on R&D, and he reflected exactly that. Day and night, he said, he does business in both parts of the island, and he said, day and night, where the culture is, can do, will do, let's look at opportunities, let's look at openings, let's look at the various sources, and if with Enterprise Ireland, you've done work with Enterprise Ireland, it's the case of you ring a person and that person is your mentor. Is there anything we can learn there? And at what point do you feel we, we could come up to that level or that benchmark of performance? Uh, just a, a brief comment on that. Uh, I think we do recognise that one of the themes within the draft innovation strategy is a, a change of culture in the, in the, in the, in the public service. You know, recognising that, that it is relatively cautious, if not very cautious. And you know, I think what you're illustrating is what, what appears to be more of a, a can-do approach as opposed to am I allowed to do it approach. And uh, I think uh, as, as recognised within the, the, the draft strategy, that, that isn't going to be an easy job to achieve and certainly not something we'll, we'll achieve or overnight. I think it is certainly recognised. At least some of those sentiments are acknowledged to be um, a feature of um, public service at the minute and potentially a, a feature which we could do with reshaping or moving on. So that brings me to my next point. How? And um, it's no reflection in any case on I've dealt with very, very good public servants and the likes. But how do we move to that next stage? Because that's where, as you know, many of the, of the you've already said it, many of the businesses in the north here are exporting, I think it's, what is it, 60% to the south, and many of them use that as a, a launching pad for further exports elsewhere. And that's how some of the figures can get muddled up a wee bit as well. But I'm thinking of how do we up it to the next level of performance, where we need to be if we're to be as competitive in world markets and, and other EU markets that, that we need to, to be for, for the future. How is the department invest in I saying, right, take us there. We're going to go there. What are the steps towards that? Um, that's, you know, I, I, I suspect the, the answers are not going to be easy found and the 
there are some indications of, as to the steps we'll, we, as a cross government, will have to take, because um, obviously Daddy works within the a, ver, no, a culture, uh, a set of systems and rules, which are pretty much common across all, all the departments, and there's certainly in there a reflection that we do need to do something, and I can't recall off the top of my head what uh, early priorities there are in there, but we can get back to you as to the sorts of actions that are envisaged within the culture change element of the innovation strategy and, and indicate how they may <coughs> address some of the sentiments expressed by those business people yeah, that, that you spoke well, we to. We sit here all day and identify. We know by and large, all you have to do is go out and speak to the, the sharp cookies of business people out there. They'll tell you if they're not already telling you. So the issue is identification of the problem should not be a major issue for you. Or identifying ways of dealing with that shouldn't be a major issue for you. Um, we've already picked up on some, I'm not saying that Enterprise Ireland is entirely um, without its shortcomings as well, but there are clearly good practices in there that are tailored towards businesses, and are by and large, whether it's on the R&D front, or a drawdown of funding from Europe, or health and sport and sane coaster, there's clearly good practice there that should be identified, can be identified, and what I'm looking to hear is from the department, right, this is the issue, this is the problem, what, what are the solutions here? What are the ways forward? How can we up our game? If I may come in there, Chair, I think, I think one of the objectives that we have through the Exports Action Plan will be to get that uh, get to that situation where everybody is pulling in the one direction. Um, so it's not just going to be a debt invest NI document. It's going to include other departments. It's going to include um, external stakeholders. And I think that's the focus. And I think certainly from talking to Vicky in the past, you know, that's where invest and I want to be where we want. We have everybody pulling in the same direction. Uh, to sort of address the issues that you're highlighting to us. And if I could just add some of the things that, that have been happening in relation to this. Uh, we are engaging with a lot of small businesses and, and micro businesses which are less than, than 10 employees. Um, I mean, a monetary value of £77 million pounds worth has been put in to support those companies and, and we are engaging more and more with them in relation to the export message. And we're utilising their peers to try and get that can-do attitude to filter across. Uh, and also in terms of the Northern Ireland diaspora, uh, Northern Ireland Connect Connections that, that uh, is operating, we're utilising the connections they ha have to again tap into resources both here in Northern Ireland and overseas to, to help generate that can-do attitude. And certainly we have found that uh, we have had a lot of good ministerial support in terms of uh, international visits and, and leading missions, leading exhibitions, which again helps to start to distill that added can do attitude uh, down throughout the population. So, you know, I, I think that there's, there's seed changes there in relation to, to taking it forward in relation to the integration of the, the action plan. I think that's where we can then take it to the next level. And the time frame for that, what you were saying, the cross-departmental or cross-agency approach to that, what's the time frame for that? Well, as, as Shane outlined um, earlier on, you know, there's a number of pieces of work which are coming to fruition at the minute. We would hope to be in a position by the summer that we would have at least a draft um, that we would be discussing with people and... and um, of the draft you know, exports action, draft plan. Export action plan. Mm -hmm. The innovation strategy is obviously further down the road. It's sort of nearing, nearing completion. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Mr Anderson, Sydney. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation today. Uh, Northern Ireland Chamber of Commerce provides support to, so for companies who wish to export, but they have a state that they have, do not have the same sort of difficulties as it would be in the, in the public sector in, in providing that support. Is the, the question is, is there a scope for government to fund private sector organisations such as the Northern Ireland Chamber of Commerce and FSB and CBI, such, such like, to provide support to business on delivering that support directly? I still think even, even if we were funding them to do that, we, they would still have to comply with the same governance and EU requirements that we are subject to in relation to how we support companies as, as well. So the, the fact that, that we would be funding them, you know, we, we would have to it's ensure the same. 
bureaucratic sort of uh, difficulties uh, would still exist. Well, and, that. And, and I suppose in terms of bureaucratic difficulties, um, I'm not I'm not sure exactly what is being referred to there because certainly we're undergoing an economic appraisal at the minute in relation to the support we provide for companies and to identify one of the things it will do is to identify the gaps in mm. relation to support. What we're, we're getting from them at the minute, and they're, they're just finalising the draft, is that there are no major gaps in terms of the support that's there. So I, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly where that's geared towards uh, in uh, relation I, to... I think, it's, I think it's fair to say that you know, whether public money is given to invest in I, whether it's given to a company, whether it's given to the chamber, it comes with certain standards and requirements. And, oh, um, that would be the same whether it's the chamber. There's no reflection on the chamber. It's it's just it, it comes to stand. Um, whether it be whether be state aid rules as well. Again, th those apply um, across the board, and it's, again, it's no reflection on, on on the chamber or anyone else. It's 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 a set of standards that we we must comply with. They also they also believe in building networks, and it's crucial. They see it as crucial to to exporting, uh, and the state that of a company is of sufficient scale or size. That it can tap into invest in a, a, a network, but at other companies, and if I'm allowed to touch on the SMEs again, but sure, some fairly. some discussion uh, go down that road again. Uh, the talk with them in particular, can I get the same level of, of support, uh, despite them having offers from maybe 12 or 14, as I said, different different agencies. Would you wish to comment on that again? In, in terms of the export support for companies. Um, it's available to, to companies as long as they are have the potential to export. So any company has the potential to export, we will take them to you, we will help them with the research, we will take them to the market at the right time, we'll, they will get the same funding as someone who has been exporting to two, three other countries. Um, so you know, as long as a company is able to come, will work to do the research. Um, and understand what the opportunities are, identify the right market. You know, we will work with them, um, and that's for potential exporters as well as those already exporting. We don't see that as a, a difficulty in that area either. No. no. Okay. Um, they see themselves maybe as filling this gap. You would not agree with that. I'm I'm open to, to looking at working in partnership with people. So. Uh, what I, I want uh, to get to the stage is that we, we have a very clear landscape for businesses. You know, they are the customer in this. So what we need to do is ensure that businesses get the right help at the right time in the right way. And you know, if, if we can get more people working together to deliver that what I would call a continuum for businesses, then that's, that's great. And as long as people uh, are, know the area that they're focusing on and we can all work together, then I'm, I'm more than happy to work with people in relation to Do that. they see themselves maybe performing a role that they shouldn't be? Should be maybe you people should perform in that role. What would you have to say about that? Does, does Invest NI need to change its focus to, uh, to, to provide more support to the SMEs? That's where they're coming from. Well, I, th I think if, if you look at our landscape, we're very much an S of the SME economy. Yeah. And if you look at the number of companies that we support, they are all SMEs. I mean, every company really you know, is falling into that category. Uh, and if you look at the successes we have had in relation to the trade side of things, you know, it's SMEs who are, are, are the ones that are being highlighted in, in relation to the successes, you know, and, and that is who we work with. Another issue that the Chamber looked at was the, the, has called for clarity around the, the concept of an, uh, an, uh, an FSDNI client, uh, what, that, what that means. Uh, <coughs> what is the, they say, what is an FSDNI client? And the, the committee itself was on the impression that in the 2009 independent review of the economic policy recommendation to abolish the concept of uh, an FSDNI client that had been accepted and implemented. Uh, is that the case? We, we, we deal, Invest and I deal with, with uh, a wide range of companies, and different parts of Invest and I deal with, with uh, different ranges of those companies. So, in relation to the trade side and the export side, uh, as I mentioned, we will deal with potential exporters and, and try and help them develop. Um, in relation to the, the definition of the, of the Invest and I client, you're right, uh, that, that has undergone review, uh, and, and we talk about um, account managed. Clients, and then there are, are clients who are not account managed but would still engage with Invest NI. So the concept of the Invest NI client is gone. 
um, and we do deal with the wider range of, of companies. But again, it is devoting the right sort of uh, support to companies at the right stage of their development. Okay, thanks, Dr. Clark. Just, uh, Vicky, uh, you did clarify the legal advice on up to ten thousand pounds a year, uh, but yeah, I think you mentioned it at the very beginning about the language barrier. Could you expand just quickly on that? What that means? Uh, what support you give there in the language barrier? Uh, we give again. We give up to ten thousand pounds a year support uh, at, at a rate of fifty percent uh, for translation costs. Uh, we, we gear that towards uh, companies moving into new markets or introducing a new product. Because if a company has been in, in, in a market for ten years, you know, we're not going to continue to, to fund uh, them translating their, their brochure. Yeah. So if it's a, if they're moving into the market first time, or if it, they're bringing a new product into that market for the first time, then we will help with the translation. So cost. with every new product or new market. You Absolutely, would... and, and, and then we can also that can also be used toward translation costs whenever they're engaging in meetings to to secure initial yeah. contracts. Also, uh, thanks for that clarification. Thank you, okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Frew. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I want to go back on to the, the strategy and action plan uh, for exports. I know you've touched on it and there's been very, a lot of questions on it. But just to tease out a wee bit more of the, the detail, because that's something that the Chamber of Commerce uh, said that they thought there was too many strategies and so much data out there that it was very, very confusing for uh, probably smaller companies that maybe uh, aren't, get, aren't getting the interest and the support maybe invest in I would to the likes of right buses and the Mitchells and, 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 and such like. I would worry that whilst we need uh, an action plan and a strategy that is focused, will it be an add-on to everything else that's out there? In other words, it's another piece of material that companies will have to assess, or, or will one strategic action plan deliver for all the spheres uh, and then everything else falls into that or is made redundant? Could I, could I clarify a question as to whether this is uh, whether this the, it's I'm not entirely is your question about the, what companies face, or is your question? Yeah, about well, well, co companies would say, and the Chamber of Commerce would say, and they told us that they, they can't see the, the, the wood for the trees, for instance. Uh, that unless they're good at what they do, which could be making something, uh, <coughs> they, need, they really need assistance to get into break into markets, to sell their ware elsewhere, and that whilst they go and seek help, it is very complicated at that front door, that step. Uh, to actually get the help they need quickly without too much bother. Because whilst their mind is completely concentrated on making something, it's very, very hard, then, especially for a small business, to actually employ someone to actually work this through day in, day out, and go to the person in Invest NI in who will actually be able to concentrate um, their focus on their needs. OK, th thanks. thank you for the clarity. Um, that will be one of the priorities within our action plan. Uh, as Vicky illustrated uh, to, to, the, to the previous question, um, there, is, there is no desire that uh, Invest and I has to do all of the functions of this. There are absolutely other, other contributors out there that are playing a role, but the, the ideal outcome is where Everyone understands the role and, and um, sticks to that remit and does that consistently. So then companies understand, well, if I'm at a certain stage, I know who to go to. As I start to become a more experienced exporter or start to grow, mm -hmm. then I, I'm passed on to the, 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 the next provider in the continuum. And I think it's fair to say, Vicky, at the moment, there isn't that nice, neat clarity of rules and responsibilities, and it would be desirable if we could get to that stage. But how do we get there? Because this is, and, and I don't envy your task, because this is a very complicated sphere where you make a device that, or an object that might well be suitable to one region of the world, not the other. Uh, every country will have a different plan, uh, easier to get into, harder to get into. 
needing to speak to the right people, all different levels of government, all different levels of business. So uh, this is something that is so vast and complicated. And I don't envy your task. So how do you ever get that into a streamlined strategy, which we actually need? Because it's great because you know exactly what we need to do. But how do we ever get there? How do we ever get that on the ground? And then how do we ever get the businesses to realise this is what's in place? So I suppose if, if I can just pick up in, in terms of certain points of that, because I, I, I think that there's two aspects there. There's, there's the strategy, which you know, I mentioned the continuum of support previously, and, and that would be the ideal, the ultimate, where there's a continuum based on the stage of development of, of an exporter, uh, from non-exporter right the way through, and people are very clear in terms of, of the support that's being provided in relation to that. And it should be seamless to the customer, and that's the, it, that's the important thing. If, if you're taking the example that you, you mentioned there about a company who maybe have invented something, and then how do they get it sold and in the market? Um, to my mind, you, they, they are at a certain stage of development, so they are, are in a, a, an inexperienced exporter, is what I would call them. And certainly that's where, again, we, we have helped and, and do help those types of companies if they approach us. We have mechanisms in place uh, to help that company, so we have one-to-one -one support to, to the, where an advisor can actually work with that company on a one-to-one -one basis to develop the market entry plan for them, how they're going to go about doing it. And we have had this in situations where companies have come with a product that they have actually um, produced and actually developed, and we've been able to use our design offering and, and help within Invest in I to get them to tailor it so it's suitable for the country that they're then starting to, to look at uh, and trying to access. We have that one-to-one -one support. We have the way we can get them into to, to market. Um, the one thing I, I would say, and, and this, this is one of the realities of exporting, you know, it takes time, it takes commitment, and it takes effort to export, and it takes money. Um, you, if there are a lot of things to be gained from exporting, but companies need to realise that they need to commit the time, money, resource and, and, and effort into doing that. And we can't solve all of those. We can help, but we can't solve all of those. Uh, and therefore, part of that one-to-one -one support, working out the entry plan with that company is an ideal way for them to realise what they need to do and then determine how they're going to do it. Yeah. How, how do you, with all the complications given, and you try and streamline and simplify things as much as possible. But yet, the complexities are great. How do we ever get that balance? You know, how, how do we ever get the, the, the businesses, will the, the, the different scope of businesses, even the regions, will you be looking to target or, or, or help but companies in, will have different needs and different wants and different mannerisms even. How do you ever build that focused strategic path with the flexibility that's required. And, and that's where, because we have the, the different in-market advisors, we can bring a lot of those market complexities through, through their knowledge, through their intelligence. I mentioned we had split the world up into four. You know, so again, within the, the Northern Ireland operation, we too have people who are focusing on those particular markets. So they understand the nuances. They, they can get access to the, the needs of the regulations, because obviously it's different for every sector and even subsector. But we can get that detail, and we can then help the company define how they go about taking the necessary steps to either get the qualifications, accreditations, uh, and the mannerisms that they need to adopt in order to sell it, and, and coach them through that. Uh, so the mechanisms are there. Um, what we, we do is, is we have got, if you like, a suite of interventions, but we can customise those. Uh, and that's, I think that's the important thing. That, you know, I, I mentioned before, it's not a, it's not a one-size-fits-all, and that's the important thing. There's a framework. But then we can make sure it meets the needs of the company. Okay, thank you, thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks for that, Paul. And uh, um, finally, Mr. Flanagan. Thanks, Patsy, and thanks for the, the presentation. I won't keep you wrong. One of the comments you made was uh, around corporation tax. Can I ask what the link between corporation tax and exports is? Uh, well, there, there's, there, 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 there's, there was, there's, there's two obvious links. Um, uh, the first link was that. Um, there was a plan to do, or a potential plan to do, an enterprise strategy. And rather than do an here's an enterprise strategy with X, with the powers and corporation tax, and here's a, a very different enterprise strategy without the powers and corporation tax. Um, at that stage, it was not envisaged that corporation tax would be deferred until after a, 
until after a, a Scottish referendum. So it was just a, a general point that there was a plan to do an enterprise strategy, which would have a co component in exports, but because the decision in corporation tax was put back, we, uh, the conclusion was <coughs> well, we shouldn't wait to do something in exports by holding back an enterprise strategy. We should take forward the exports bit. So that, that's, that, that was the, 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 the point I was trying to make. Right. So where is the enterprise strategy now? Because the enterprise, the enterprise strategy has always been dependent upon, once we know the landscape, whether we have corporation tax which, or, or whether we don't, and th there's quite a big difference in what you would prioritise with and without the powers. You know, you know, the sorts of things that Invest and I, their client executives, would be doing could be very, very different. But, but for a, a company with less than 10 employees, what difference does whether corporation tax powers have been devolved or not? Uh, this was from the view of what um, the organisation of Invest and I and government support would be with and without corporation tax. It, with corporation tax and a reduced corporation tax, in terms of your offering on FDI changes substantially, and with that, the the work day day to day by a lot of folks in Invest and I changes substantially. That, that was the, the, the point that was being made. I, I, I'm, I'm, I understand that if, for, for companies out there that you know, maybe not making many profits by the corporation taxes high or low, you know, may not make a big difference. But this was how we organise ourselves would be very different with, with a substantial power or without a su substantial power. So uh, it, it, was just, it was just a point to, to indicate that our strategy going forward in enterprise could take two very different routes with and without corporation tax, <coughs> because the decision in corporation tax was uh, at that stage kicked back by whatever it was a year and a half. The conclusion was that we should start working exports because that's a big enough priority that we can take that forward separately. Right. So if the power to set corporation tax is devolved and the decision is taken to reduce corporation tax, what would that mean for your enterprise strategy and how you would be trying to support? Small and, and medium-sized businesses here that wouldn't benefit from it. Well, there's a section, if I may, chair. There's a section within the economic strategy which outlines the issues that we know we need to address. Should we secure the power to uh, to, to vary corporation tax? So we recognise that that will mean we will need to shift our focus towards greater levels of innovation because it's not just about corporation tax; it's about having the innovation and the R&D base to attract companies. We know we need to do a lot of additional work on skills, because if these companies are coming uh, to invest in Northern Ireland, they are going to require a skilled workforce. So there is a whole section in the economic strategy which outlines at a high level what we will need to do, uh, should we secure the power to maximise the benefits from corporation tax being devolved, and the enterprise strategy going forward post the decision on corporation tax would give more detail as to what we would be doing in those broad areas. And have you got a, an initial draft of an enterprise strategy? No. We have no initial draft, but we have a, there's a, a lot of work has been done by a number of departments. Dell have published some work in terms of the, uh, the skills requirements that a, a reduced corporation tax environment would, would require, for example. So there's a lot of work that's been done that would that we'd ultimately but, but fit into it. My point is, even if corporation tax is or isn't reduced, it's not going to have any impact on smaller organisations. So it seems to be that all your efforts are going into helping the organisations that may well benefit from a reduction in corporation tax. But what about the 99% of businesses that won't benefit from it? Well, it seems it, to be they all, have all to businesses wait. Will, make, will, will, will benefit from a reduced rate of corporation tax because that's oh. across the board. Well, if they're making profits, they won't be paying as much in terms of. But what of, if they're of not tax. paying corporation tax because they're too small? Well, the, the economic strategy then outlines a, 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 a vast uh, sort of number of, of, of commitments that the executive are taking forward um, to support businesses across the economy. But the majority of businesses here don't pay corporation tax, so they don't fall into that threshold. So they're not going to benefit from a reduction in a corporation number, and, tax. And, and, and then there's another large number that don't make any profit that wouldn't pay corporation tax either. And, and, and the economic strategy de details what we do in terms of supporting R&D and innovation across the economy, what we do in terms of supporting skills levels across the economy, and any, ben any business can benefit from those actions. And, and also, should, you know, we should bear in mind that a lot of small businesses 
you know, let's say they're they're not incorporated, so they, they they pay they don't pay corporation tax, or they may be trading at a level where you know, they're not making sufficient profits. But a lot of those companies, their success will will be improved if there's additional companies in Northern Ireland to supply more supply chain business. If there's additional companies in Northern Ireland with additional workforce and with providing people with additional spending power, they will benefit in, all, in those sorts of ways as well. So it will be important for um, lots of companies in Northern Ireland who might not necessarily see themselves as directly benefiting from a tax cut, but they do have the potential to benefit from um, additional FDI which comes in and the spending power of the supply chain and the employment created through that. And that's the solution? It's not seen. Uh, I don't think that the executive uh, or, or ministers have claimed that uh, corporation tax is the solution. They see it as uh, a, an important element which would help improve. No, but you, you're, you're telling me that if we reduce the rate of corporation tax, then that will help small businesses who may well feed into an FDI chain. But that's not helping them to export. No. And what, what I'm hearing you tell me is that we're going to wait to do something on an enterprise strategy help small businesses because corporation tax may or may not be cut. But that's no good to a small business now. What are we doing for small businesses now to help them export? Well, that's why we decided to take forward an export action plan ahead of any decision on corporation tax. So that will... We didn't feel... We felt it couldn't, we couldn't wait. wait any longer. Yes. Right. And in terms of, of the, um, the level of expertise within both the department and, and invest, um, is there considerable experience in there from um, a business background that have experience in, in exporting or, or how do you use, um, scale up on the challenges facing businesses that need to export? I can pick up in terms of that. There's a mix of backgrounds in, in terms of the people involved in, in supporting companies mm -hmm. uh, export. Um, a lot of them have business backgrounds. I myself have a business background um, and certainly we're very aware of the challenges and issues that, that uh, businesses face. We engage with businesses day in, day out and we, we understand and we talk to them about the issues that they're facing and we feed that into looking at how we can best help them and support them. Uh, in terms of the development, um, we're also taking a number of our um, trade advisors through the Institute of Exports accreditation uh, so that they can keep their development side of, of things up uh, and keep it relevant and understand the complexities uh, in relation to the whole export arena. Okay, very good. And if there was something that the committee could do to help, was there any suggestions you'd have there? To be honest, I think a lot of it goes back to, to this mindset you know, of, of getting companies to realise and the decision makers to realise that they too can export and to get the message out there that we have a lot of very good small Northern Ireland companies who are playing big parts in the global stage and we just need to get more and more to do that. So anything you can do to get that message through would be most helpful. So it's a, a fundamental change in a societal attitude really that's the, the big barrier. I think just the, the issue we talk about the complexity of one of your colleagues talk, it, it's about maybe also not frightening those people mm -hmm. and taking them away and just saying you can work through and you can start I think maybe that complexity can can uh, scare people off in the first and we're trying to strip that away by the range of programs we offer the okay. workshop at a, at a very straightforward level one of the biggest decisions that a company could make is not to export to a particular country but to export to another area because they thought their product or service would work mm -hmm. in that Mm. It turns out when they do a wee bit of work, it doesn't, but that doesn't mean it's a failed product. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that, there's a bit of mysticism and a bit of we need to just, and that's what we're doing with some of our lower and level programmes that's targeting okay. that type of... And, and <coughs> helping them do the research, which is the critical mm -hmm. thing, so that they really understand the opportunities and how they align okay. to them. Right. Thanks, okay, thanks for that. Uh, Sammy, uh, you had a final point you wanted to raise, just Yes, sir, I'll, I'll try and keep this as brief as possible. First of all, thanks very much for, uh, for the presentation. Um, I'm very impressed with this presentation here. So. Um, I think it's a good tool for MLAs, and I'm just wondering, uh, these things change as well, statistics and that, so if you could keep us updated with that, sure. that would be very helpful. Um, uh, a businessman uh, came to see me last night, and he said he'd been in China with the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, and, and he was saying that his experience w was excellent. In fact, he said, I know some people would be criticising, you know, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister can out. I'd be willing to go on television to say that my experience was he found it very, very helpful. So just wanted to say Thank that. Thank you. Well, that leads on to my other um, question. Um, this week, 
the Speaker um, hosted the High Commissioner for New Zealand, Sir Lockwood Smith, and, and I was there, and he talked about the um, the links between Northern Ireland and New Zealand, and he was saying he'd love to see more business links and tourism links. So that goes back to the, the, the map that you had here, um, Vicky. Um, I noticed that you have a presence in something like 18 locations, um, and New Zealand isn't on it. Um, I'm just wondering, but somebody said in recently that the first minister, that first minister had been invited out there. Um, so could you might tell us about some of your links with, with them? Certainly. Uh, I mean, in, in terms of picking the New Zealand bit uh, initially, uh, and, I, and I actually met him yesterday as well and had a, a very good discussion with him, a very, very nice man. Um, Obviously, there's, there's opportunities everywhere. We can't do everything, uh, and, and so that's where we need to try and prioritise to help focus our companies in relation to the opportunities. We did look at New Zealand again recently, especially with, in the light of what happened with Christchurch and the infrastructure opportunities that came there. And about two and a half years ago, we got a number of relevant companies together who could uh, facilitate the infrastructure redevelopment within Christchurch. We gave them uh, information regarding the opportunities, we talked them through what they would have to do, and to be honest, at that time they, they said, yes, we're interested, but whenever we said, well, will we take it further, they said, not at this time. We actually took uh, a number of construction companies out last November to New Zealand uh, to uh, a mission focused on construction. Uh, being honest, mixed feedback, some of them said yes, some of them said no. Uh, we're following up with those that, that said yes. Um, but uh, materials handling is also another area where there's huge opportunities. Right. But we, we, we know um, our companies who, who are actually engaging in New Zealand in that particular area, so we're working with them anyway. So although we're not formally taking uh, missions out there or have a representation, we st still are engaging and helping companies in that particular market. And yesterday, uh, during my discussion with the High Commissioner, there, there were a number of other uh, avenues that are always that, that we're going to look at and investigate, but they're, they're quite. It's good because it's quite tailored, to specific uh, opportunities that are always, So it allows us to be more focused in, in terms of who we talk to. And again, just a very last quick question, very quickly. Um, um, uh, I know a, a man who was exporting to Alaska, and he said it was a nightmare the distance. And obviously, the likes of Australia, which is is one here and New Zealand. Is, is it distant? Is that a, a big difficulty? Because I know New Zealand is something like we're 11,500 miles from Northern Ireland. It, it can be a difficulty, but I suppose I always go back to when I look at the material handling. I think uh, I think it was mentioned about you know, the, shipping the, these large machines. Around. I mean, we're shipping them to New Zealand. Oh, right. So you know, yep. people can do that. The other thing about New Zealand, and it's something to take account in time zones, they can sometimes be helpful, they can sometimes not be. New Zealand's 12 hours ahead, so therefore you, you get a full day's work. So if you send them a question and go to bed, by the time you get up in the morning, you've got the answer. So it, it helps. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just briefly, on the similar thing, the Overseas Events Programme does look impressive, and I think there's a lot of good work in there. Again, you need to encourage people, obviously, to engage and to come on board. And Absolutely. Is it difficult to get people to go on these uh, events overseas with yourselves? And it was the point that somebody was making there as well. About bringing their product, I think, is important, whether it's food or whether it's <laughs> equipment or whatever. Once people see the quality of, of our products, you know, it probably in many ways sells itself, but it's getting it out there. So what more can be done to get people engaged in, in this programme? This is a great programme and I think it's very impressive, but we need to make sure we're getting the right people on those trips. So how, how do you decide um, which people, which firms to bring? I'm sure there are a number of firms who want to go on various trips. There are, if, if a company registers an interest in, in terms of going on a mission, they may have been uh, at an event we have run, which has been really communicating and, and giving them an idea of the opportunities. Um, we would usually engage in a one-to-one -one with them to ensure that they've got the right type of offering for that uh, particular market, and also they could cope with the market. You know, once you deal with time differences and things, it, and, uh, it can become difficult. So we would engage in them on a one-to-one -one basis and ensure that they will get benefit from going on that trade mission. Um, because sometimes 
they need to go on the trade mission to actually say, make the decision. No, this isn't the right market for me. You know, and, uh, but if that if that's going to be uh, a valuable uh, decision for them to make, then it may be right for them to go on that mission. You know, so it, it's not always that they have to have a product that's right to sell now to get on the mission. Uh, but whenever they they accompany us and, and go out to market, they always bring samples with them. Uh, they always bring literature with them. One of the first things that we and, and we constantly uh, encourage companies to do is to update their websites because that's the first thing any time you try and get a meeting with a company overseas they will look at your website so you need to have the website up to date um, we also uh, ensure that whenever we take companies out with us we put together what's called a mission brochure which has got a profile of every company uh, that is on the mission and it's also translated into the relevant language so at least they've got some sort of marketing promotional material that they can use when they're out in market uh, we coach them through the cultural aspects that they, they need to take on board whenever they're going out to make, to make sure they're, they're going to make the most of their time when they're out there. So, you, it, yes, we, we, we um, work with the companies to make sure they're going to, you know, this is the right trip for them to go on. But to get companies aware of, of these events and to get them to express an interest, again, you know, okay. that, that's where we need people to be helping us communicate. All right, thanks very much for that. Thank um, you. Thank you. Just, just, just on that point, um, it must be a year ago we had the Minister and the, the Chief Executive of Invest here. And what we were trying to establish, if there was some mechanism of sharing details, promotional stuff that, that you all have, and of course we, well, I follow you on Twitter anyway, the invest stuff, but there's much, much more than that because we do have, and this is back to all this disparate amount of information that's out there, and um, really, whenever we're dealing with community and voluntary organisations, we have grant tracker and the likes of that, but at that point in time, there was a positive view that, particularly for elected members, some sort of briefing documents or the likes should have been prepared, but one year on, I don't see any any manifestation of it. So perhaps you could take that back in and reflect on it, where where that proposal went or a suggestion went to. Uh, it seems to have disappeared. Uh, as uh, believe it or not, uh, we're out and about quite a bit and talking to a lot of people. It's the nature of what we do, and uh, it's vitally important that that connection be established. We're not hearing it. It's it's a, an element off the link is missing too and that's all part of the cultural thing that you were mm. talking about and I don't accept that as an excuse by the way that's just another challenge in those areas where it's affected yeah. or those people that it's affected so um, thanks very much for your time oh uh, just one final thing the agri-food strategy now that seems to have um, there was monies allocated for that that weren't spent and um, it, where is that at the moment? Where does that fit in? Uh, you, upon you, earlier? Just, just to be clear, are you talking about the, the Agri Food Strategy Board report, which is to go to the executive, or the Agri Food Loan Scheme? No, the loan scheme was a small element of it. Okay. Sorry. <clears throat> the, the, there's two specific questions in that. You're quite right to say that. Sure. One is, where is the outworkings of that Agri Food Strategy at the moment? And secondly, has there been any reflection done on the poor take-up or lack of take-up of the, the monies that were set aside for the, the loans that we're talking about? OK. Um, my understanding of the up-to-date position, um, I think the Minister, in relation to the Agri-Food Strategy Board report, answered a question on this on Monday in the Assembly. Um, you know, the indication that she gave was that you know, there, there's no one holding this up, that um, she very much hoped that the executive would endorse the report, but she did recognise that there were wider resource pressures which don't make these sorts of decisions any, any easier. Um, so my understanding is it's, it's on its way to the executive. In relation to the... the Sorry, that seems to have been an issue for quite a while now. I, I, I'm not in, in well, a maybe, position to understand. I mean, we, we My understanding is a joint paper has been agreed between the, right, the okay. Agriculture Minister and our Minister, and this is on its way to the Executive, albeit you know, there are wider resource issues and pressures, which, mm -hmm. which I, I, as I understand it, don't make the, the call particularly easy right. on, on, on a number of fronts. In relation to, to the loan scheme, the, you know, the negotiations with the banks are finished. Those terms that were agreed were, have been translated into a suite of legal documents, 
um, the bank solicitor has recommended those documents to bank decision makers. Mm -hmm. The lead poultry processor for the, the poultry scheme has indicated that they are content with those commitments within those documents that fall to, to them. Four out of six banks have indicated that they have taken the agreements through their internal approval processes. We in government have taken them through, have taken it through our own internal approvals, through DFP approval and ministerial approval. And uh, if, if we use the terminology right, the, the lawyers are preparing the to issue what they call the execution versions, and some of you may know what. The, uh, that uh, that language. My understanding, this is the the versions that are signed. Okay. And once 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 those versions are signed, right. the the banks can open the scheme and and, and accept that's application. Right. And my understanding is, say those are those are oh. going out this week. Right, that's grand. Thanks for that. Uh, yeah, just on a point of information, Patrick, uh, the Dard, the Art Committee has done a piece of work on both those issues too, and, and it uh -huh. seems to be as consistent as seen as saying. Uh, it's sitting at the executive with regards to the agri-food report and then the, the, the loan scheme was going through legalities and, and making enough. sure everybody was on board. Okay, thanks for that and, and thank you for your time and uh, look forward to seeing you at some stage in the future then. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just go to your own Members, if we could just, it might be helpful as well given that a lot of this was inspired by the uh, the Chamber of Commerce, the Northern Ireland Chamber of Commerce. Um, the Hansard, Hansard record of it here today. Uh, our members agreed that we share the Hansard with the Chamber of Commerce yeah. too. And yes. It may inspire some further dialogue, but that would be all for the good. Okay, great. Pass yeah. resume the, the Chamber's meeting with officials from Daddy and Invest, and I will discuss the report. Uh. I would hope so. Right. Given last week's performance. So you, whenever you're sticking a, a note to them with the Hansard, you can recommend it to seek to meet. Yeah. Do that. Thanks for that. Um, agenda item number five: an oral briefing from Betty on the Consumer Rights Bill Legislative Consent Motion. And papers for this are included at page 100. And the clerk's briefing and a summary of consultation responses which includes the proposed post consultation decision. And um, <coughs> that's just numbers page 100. And with us here today we have Dennis Cunningham. The head of uh, Consumer Affairs Branch and Jimmy Hughes, the Deputy Chief Trading Standards Officer. Um, you're both very welcome. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Commissioner. It's usually uh, on a Saturday morning that we hear Jimmy waxing eloquently here about consumer related <laughs> matters and dealing with them and, and dealing with them very well, too. So just, just to put that on the record to you, Jimmy. Thank you. That it's always refreshing to hear um, a public servant who's, um, who, who's got his. his uh, full capacity of the range of issues out there and uh, able to, to, to communicate them outwards to the people in the language that they understand too. So, Thank you very much. So thank you for that. Um, anyway. We weren't expecting that. Almost not. Uh, <laughs> ah, well, no. Uh, it's not finished yet. No, it's not finished yet. No, well, I'm not. Well, no. I'm the um, praise where it's required and where it's needed. Um, so, um, you know the score. Uh, you know how it operates here. You have um, up to 10 minutes to present to us what the issue is as you see it, and then we'll have a few questions from members. Okay. Okay. Um, I suppose just by way of sort of introduction, the committee obviously will be aware that um, plans to sort of introduce consumer rights and some kind of consolidation around consumer rights has been worked on by uh, Westminster, the Department of Business Innovation and Skills, for something like two years now. Um, I think it's a good news story, um, both for consumers and for businesses. It is, I'm sure members will have seen in the, in the links that we provided to members, it's a comprehensive uh, bill, covers a, a lot of very detailed technical uh, aspects to transactions and the supply of goods, the supply of services. It's, also, it's attempting to harmonise and clarify across those areas of consumer law where I think it's fair to say that there's been um, not not confusion, but uh, the, the, there, there has been sort of um, a need to provide legal interventions at times more than you would, would, would have wished to, to resolve disputes. Um, this bill is attempting across the UK to uh, clarify where there's been those uncertainties and um, also introduce some new aspects where existing legislation uh, was not covered, for example, like digital content. Um, and because this legislation obviously does apply across the UK, you know, I suppose the question could be asked, well, well why, 
given that Northern Ireland has devolved responsibility for consumer protection, why, why would we not do our own? And it's a fair question, but I think the answer is probably even it's, it, the answer is more important than the question because, from a business perspective and a consumer perspective, whether you're a consumer in Northern Ireland or in Scotland, England, Wales, you're inevitably going in and, and uh, carrying out transactions and buying uh, goods from many firms that operate across the UK. And the one thing that we try, and Jimmy in his, in his trading standards role over the years, we, we try to maintain that there's a consistency for both businesses, whether they happen to have operations in Scotland, Glasgow, Newcastle, Liverpool, or here in Belfast. So the need to maintain a parity um, and a consistency for protecting consumers and to be fair to trades and businesses. That's the reason why there's a UK-wide approach to this rather than a, a Northern Ireland uh, doing its own thing. In fact, having said that, if there had been a rationale, a policy rationale or a need coming through from the, from the trade bodies or from organisations like, uh, you know, the small confederation of business industry, all that sort of stuff, if there'd been a demand or a need for Northern Ireland to have something different then it would have come to the fore. That has not happened. Um, the need to maintain parity for trading purposes and indeed for consumers going to, to, to the UK, anywhere in the UK, to have a consistent approach in resolving disputes. Quite often, you know, we buy goods and services from companies who are actually based elsewhere in the United Kingdom, so it's important to have a, a, a redress which is consistent. This Consumer Rights Bill um, has been an opportunity to consolidate and bring together where there's been differences um, purchasing cars, for example, you know, uh, the, the, the different rules and regulations which come into play there. I mean, if you're, not, if you're on SAS side, if you just bought a car, uh, you, you know, the, the reasonable consumer would think, God, it, it, it's something wrong with it. I bought it two weeks ago. It's not right. I want a refund. Even simple matters like that become complex because the, the volume of legislation which comes into play to cons to, in, in terms of consumer protection is not as clear as it should be. This bill will make that kind of um, problem a lot clearer. There'll be a 30-day, a, a sorry, Jim, a 30-day um, option to... To just simply say, I want to reject the goods, they're faulty, and at that point, you have the right to give it back. As matters stand at the present time, the question is, is it reasonable? Have you accepted? And to answer the question, is it reasonable, is virtually impossible. You're always sort of looking at different circumstances. Now it's very hard and fast. If there's something wrong, the trader gets a shot to fix it. If the trader is unable to fix it, then the, tra the consumer is entitled to reject it, and that is very basic. So I think, I think in summary, the, you know, the rationale for it being done on a UK-wide basis is, what I, as I've explained there, that the, 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 the problems facing consumers and businesses across the UK are consistently the same. There's yes. nothing unique to Northern Ireland in that regard. And in fact, on the, on the broader scale of things, I suppose in an ideal world, we would have, given that a lot of our consumers are buying stuff online mm -hmm. from, from, from areas in Europe, you know, ideally Europe would come together and harmonise at some point in time. This bill will enable, if that move was to happen in any really meaningful way, it will position the UK and Northern Ireland within that to respond to that initiative more easily because we will have one consumer rights bill. OK, thank you for that. I was actually going to ask you about the online stuff, but you, you get in ahead of me. Um, Mr Flanagan, Phil. Thanks, Patsy. I'm still trying to come up with a lot of questions here, but I'll tear, tear on now. Um, I, I don't think anybody would um, reject the need for updated consumer legislation. I think it's about 30 years since it was a comprehensive piece of legislation, um, and there have been significant changes since then. So we're, we're all accepting of that. But, but personally, I don't accept the, the rationale that we have to do the same thing that's happening in England and Wales. Um, I'd be very reluctant to allow a Tory led government to bring in changes. That are going to have an impact on consumers' rights because I don't think they'd have the consumers' rights at the, the heart of what they're trying to do. So we'd be very reluctant to do that. Um, I think when we have an issue that's a, a devolved matter, that we have a local assembly and a local executive elected in charge of bringing in legislation on a range of issues, that we should embrace that opportunity. Um, and that's something that we should do. I don't think we should hand over the power to the British government, um, not knowing how the bill is going to. To finalise, because you're asking us to support a legislative consent motion here for a piece of legislation that we don't know how it's going to look, because it's still only going through early stages. It hasn't went through um, either of the Houses of Parliament in England yet. So I'd be reluctant to support it at this stage, uh, because we don't know what it's going to look like. Um, there are um, questions um, being raised about how appropriate it is, um, how wide-ranging it is. 
and I don't accept the need that there has to be a single system across um, Britain and the North. Um, with devolution here, we can bring them to every kind of a system that we feel is best to protect the needs of consumers. Um, and you can say that there's nothing unique about the north of Ireland, but you know we do have a border. An awful lot of people that shop in the north come from the south, and an awful lot of consumers in the north go to the south to do their shopping. So we do have that situation that needs to be addressed, and that's not going to be dealt with by a British government. But we also have a, a situation where um, the EU Consumer Rights Directive um, needs to be implemented. Um, needs to be brought in across all member states by the 13th of June. So what's been done to make sure that we are going to meet um, that directive? Oh, the, the, sorry, can I just ask on that? Um, um, I'm just reading here that um, the, the Minister agreed to Northern Ireland and included in the UK wide consultation of provisions. Um, some of the provisions of the bill are being reserved. So could you maybe explain Band, it says okay, can you answer the, the well, question I asked him first, and then they'll go back to yours, because it's a different oh, one. Sorry, I'm just picking yours back is a really different issue. issue. It is, but I want just... <laughs> he's going to answer yours, surely, Phil. But I just want that answered for my own mind as well. OK. Um, I'd have to sort of to answer that by, by saying that, you know, from a consumer perspective, um, and a business perspective here in Northern Ireland, you know, if, if these, a lot of the companies in which our consumers are dealing with operate in England, Scotland, and Wales. I, I, th I think from that point of view. Hi, but, but which of them operate in England, Scotland, and Wales, and the North, and don't operate in the South? You know, they're well used to having different systems. The, the, I, I couldn't go into the details of exactly what's wrong. Even the likes of Tesco operates even in foreign markets, yeah. but primarily operates as a, as a supermarket within the United Kingdom and, and, and other other. Sort of um, car manufacturers operate in other countries throughout, throughout Europe. You're quite right in the world, but I suppose coming up with the rationale for why, I mean, you know, th there there is a body of legislation which exists at mo at the moment to help consumers get redress across when purchasing goods or indeed purchasing services, and at the moment it's all over. Um, this bill will make it clear and clarified. I'd love other areas to do exactly the same. And in fact, I think it's true that I couldn't give you specific examples, but it, but it is true that other, other areas do look at what the UK introduce and do copy uh, or try to replicate what we, what we do introduce. Um, on the, the, I mentioned the digital content. I mean, that one, you're quite right. That, that's an area that spreads across Europe. You know, there's a, there's a need to respond to that from a consumer's perspective. At the minute, there's weaknesses. There are weaknesses uh, in terms of downloaded content. This bill will put that right. If you're looking at it from a consumer perspective, I think it's, a, 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 it, it's very clear that there's big benefit here in getting clarify, in clarifying exactly what their rules are. The debate as to whether it should be within Northern Ireland or a separate UK. One of the aspects which would have to be considered within that was, yes, we could do our own, but the, the, the effort that would need to go into what, would be, what you would effectively be doing would be replicating and duplicating what is in this bill anyway, because there are, there are no details, and, and it is, it, it's actually already in the House of Commons on the 23rd of January, so, and there is a detailed bill with the proposal. We know exactly what it means. We know exactly how you know, the proposals are... And the proposal, but it's not a finalised yes, bill, then. But there's been, no, that's true. But there's been, there's been large-scale consultation across the UK with businesses, with trade associations, with trading standards authorities of exactly what it's going to mean, yes. and a serious effort made to sort of evaluate its impact. And who did they engage with here? They came and had presentations in public forum here. With whom? Um, they've also had inputs from Consumer Council here. Mm -hmm. So uh, Consumer Council would, would have would, has provided yeah. input to this as well. OK. But in, in terms of um, the, the role of the department here, is it not your responsibility to introduce legislation um, to protect consumers? I don't understand why you're handing that responsibility over to another government. Uh, could I just ask, <clears throat> I'm trying to get to the bottom of this myself, are, are you saying just um, to me that essentially it would be a cut and paste exercise if you did do? No, they're handing over the whole power to set the legislation to no, the um, British No, government. sorry, I'm talking about if you were to bring in specific okay. legislation here. We, we would be duplicating or replicating what GB are, are introducing okay. because that's what consumers and businesses need here too. Right. Um, you know, the legislative consent motion guidance um, states that, you know, where there's an existing body of legislation which is applicable to the UK, that it's legitimate to use an LCM method to, to bring its relevance here. There are elements of devolve that are not devolved mm -hmm. in relation to competition, That's right. which this bill is also addressing. You would end up creating a confused environment for consumers and businesses, whereby uh, some elements would be looking to the, the Northern Ireland um, uh, 
duplication of the, of the rest of the GB bill and other elements for competition, you'd be still depending on what happens across the water to give you guidance on that. From a business perspective and a consumer perspective, that's not a good place to go. Consolidation and harmonisation is, 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 makes a lot more sense. You're right that Northern Ireland could. <coughs> it would be, nobody has provided any body of evidence to suggest that we should. We do have our own legislation. We do produce our own legislation in relation to weights and measures, because in that area, there is a, a need for Northern Ireland to have some sometimes specifically different right. legislation. But in terms of determining whether we need our own specific piece of legislation, who did you ask? Well, B BIS uh, wrote to Office of First Minister, Deputy First Minister, seeking the permissions to, to progress along that basis. They then consulted widely in Scotland, England, Wales, and here in Northern Ireland, and sought views. Scottish colleagues, interestingly, interestingly, and it's you know, uh, w would like to have been in the same position of us of having devolved responsibilities for consumer protection. Mm -hmm. They were refused that right. But I would argue, from our experience here in Northern Ireland, given, given what we know about the actual workings of consumer protection legislation and law, mm -hmm. i.e. in terms of Sale of Goods Act and pr provision of sales and, and, <coughs> and services, that although you have it, it makes eminent sense to maintain a parity yeah. with what happens in the rest of the UK. And the Scottish uh, Law Society actually confirmed the same when this bill was produced, and they're delighted that it's addressing many of the concerns that they would have had from a Scottish perspective are now being enacted in this bill. Yeah. Can I just... Uh, well, there's two things. First of all, so OFM, DFM have agreed to this process coming this route, right? Second thing is, Jimmy, I saw you indicating that you were looking to come in there at one point during the discussion. Sorry, can we just get clarity as to what OFM, DFM actually agreed to, what's we were written to by this minister mm -hmm. asking for their agreement to go ahead and, and uh, commence a consultation process with a view to bringing in such a piece of legislation. What was the response? That, that, that response was agreed. And that you could, they could do a consultation? Yes. Or that they would bring in an overarching piece of legislation that we would be, that and we the would Assembly be, and the Executive would endorse it? Sorry. Uh, that, we, oh, that, that has yet to happen, mm -hmm. uh, that, right. that we could Obviously. proceed with the consultation. Yeah. Jimmy, you'd wanted to come in there. We seem to be talking about what looks like as if we're talking about a very radical reform. Yes. The short and long of this is that you could almost prosecute somebody under the trade descriptions for describing this as a radical reform. <laughs> <laughs> Effectively, what they have done is it's like to come the end of the season and the cure trade bring out a new model and the papers are full of it and you flood down to see this new model and do you know what it looks like? It looks like the one that was sitting there last week and you're wondering what's different about that? Oh yeah, there's a different button on the radio. Fantastic. <laughs> you know, we're really in truth seven on going it. through this legislation. Let's think of the things that we do. We buy and sell goods. Virtually no change. Yes. We buy and sell services. Virtually no change. They had to bring in rules in relation to digital content. Uh, I'm not of the age to do it, but my children tell me, and my, their children tell me, that you don't buy an LP anymore or a CD, that you press a button and it's downloaded. And the legislation on that just didn't exist. We didn't know why it was good. We didn't know why it was services. We weren't quite sure who actually owned it even after you'd paid the money. So they brought in something, I think, as a sort of a stopgap in relation to digital. And if you look at the rules in relation to digital content, where you go back to see what your rights are, they look almost identical to what you would have found if you had been looking at the Sale of Goods Act. Right. So if we're talking about, let's say this is an opportunity to build a new consumer uh, I don't know, empire, if it may be the word, or at least a new regime for consumerism. We basically are only taking a very small step and we're codifying that which is in place at the present time. Yes, really and it would be a, a rash time to say, let us go off on our own or let us say, let's go down a different avenue altogether. What we would be basically then saying is, well, the entire surface on which our consumers, and indeed not only our consumers, but our business people are putting to work, would be kicked out from underneath them. And that's, I'm just concerned in looking at this bill from where it is. It is not the radical change that everybody thinks. It introduces one thing that will impact on consumer, and that is the 30-day period to say, right, I've had it. And that's it. But, uh, Jimmy, that, that's not all, the only change it does. What it does is it hands away the responsibility of this executive to introduce consumer rights legislation. Is it? No, that, well, that. it would be making that particular step is a rather strong way of putting it, because the right is not handed in. We are uh, allowing the uh, other parliament to 
codify and to restructure the thing. If we were actually thinking, let us have a radical roots reform, I think at that point would be the time to say, well, yes, we want to have a stronger and harder input. Well, why aren't we doing that? Well, I don't think this is the time to go at the present time. We have had a legislative system that greatly works. What it has done is, I think there's seven different rules in relation to how you buy something, seven right. different contracts. And basically, somebody has got a kind of a bit fed up with it and put them all together. Mm -hmm. And that really is what this is. It may have some little extra bits and pieces, but the main drift of the thing is like the new car, everything's greatly the same as it was before. Uh, to be quite honest with you, the, the, the owner of the old curiosity shop where he's still in business could quite comfortably operate within this system. And the system's not imposing anything on you. If a businessman is operating a proper business today, there's nothing in here that's going to change his proper business. A trader, a consumer going down the town to buy will get help from the day and hour he goes down the town. He'd know that he has 30 days to say, right, I've had enough, let me get out of here. So it's not looking... If you were saying, would I like to see changes in consumer law, I'm quite sure there are very good ones. This is not perhaps the one that's actually carrying them. So if we're handing away yes. legislative authority, we're handing it away in the interests of expediency, and we aren't handing it that particularly far because by the time it's finished it's going to be what they started off to a greater or lesser extent. But in, in terms of a, a radical reform, what changes are needed to consumer rights that aren't included in this bill that if we were to do our own bill we could include? Oh, this is well beyond my, my pay grade, to be quite honest I, I, I with you. I think it goes to the point at the start, Jimmy, that nobody has provided any evidence or any, submitted any uh, response to the consultations to suggest that there are any gaps. But you haven't done a consultation, Dennis. But this has consulted here but in you Northern haven't. Ireland. But the uh, department here hasn't. Hold on, you may just let him respond. Yep. There has been a public consultation carried out at our, at our offices in, 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 in Newton Breeding Training Standards, and the Con Consumer Council, who are very well versed in, in portraying the, the, the needs and views of consumers going, going forward, have, have welcomed this and have not identified anything different or peculiar to the needs for, for businesses or consumers here in Northern Ireland. And if, if the department, this is my last question, Roger, if the department was going to bring in um, its own bill, have you the resources to deal with it within your department? I, I, I smile because it's, mm. it, 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 it's true to say that there is an army of officials within the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills in London that, that, that look, I mean, if you look at any one of these things within, within this bill, you know, the, the Sale of Goods Act alone, the manpower and, and resource needed to, to to, to look at that in the details, I mean, we have a, a lot of experience and expertise in that regard in trading standards here in Northern Ireland. Actually, the envy of most. So we, we would be able to import and have been able to import if we'd saw that there was gaps or changes that needed to happen, which would be a benefit to others, we can. Um, but there would be a significant resource element. But to be honest, if that was necessary, it, it, we would have coped with it and found a way to do it. The reality is the policy rationale for doing it is sound. There is no... There's no need to deviate from a business or consumer perspective from what from the current uh, legislative body which is out there, as Jimmy says, isn't, isn't fundamentally changing in any great way. I, I think if, if you reverse the argument, look at what are the benefits to Northern Ireland? Well, if you're a business in Northern Ireland, you know, over the long run, this is going to save you money because it must be a nightmare for businesses out there at the moment to train its staff across all the different legislative pieces concerning consumer law to make sure that they deal with consumers right at the point of sale and afterwards and in redress. They spend a lot of money training staff up in the different pieces of legislation for supplier goods, supplies, services, uh, distance uh, transactions, all the rest of it. This will enable their training to be a lot simpler and will actually save them money in the long run. So it's good news for businesses. It's good news for consumers because hopefully the clarification of rules and the consistency of the 30 days, for example, will, will mean that disputes will not be as, as, as bad or as vigorous as they are under the current dispersed sort of range of legislation. And hopefully consumers will benefit from that. OK. Well, right. Thanks very much for that. Um, Mr Fru. Yes, thank you, Chair. And again, I think we are labouring a point here. We have, we have tools and devices in, within democracy here, and an LCM is one of those such devices that can help to bring in uh, uh, law uh, in, a, in an efficient manner. Uh, and again, 
I take Phil's point where he's quite entitled to scrutinise this and scrutinise it to death, but I do believe that Phil's point's more to do with sovereignty. Uh, and to be fair, if it's a UK-wide uh, law that needs to come in to protect and enhance <coughs> the, the safeguards that consumers enjoy here already, making it more simplified, bringing it into one piece of legislation, I think this, as a committee, should be supporting it. It does not, as far as I can see, it does not give up our right or any right that we would have as an, an assembly or as an executive to bring forward legislation in our own right if we feel there's gaps there. We, I feel that this is good legislation, common sense legislation we're in, tying everything in together in one place to make it handier for consumers and businesses to, to do and trade. And to be honest with you, I think this is something that this committee should be supporting. So that's, that's grand. I don't think we require a response to that. There wasn't a question in there. I was waiting for one, but it's a, it's a statement rather than anything else. Uh, Gordon, Mr Dunn. Yeah, I think I would support my colleague there. I think we're, we're unfortunately getting into a bit of a political debate. It's not a political issue. We're part of the United Kingdom. The intention of the majority of people is to remain within the UK, and I think people across the table need to... I think to... you've just made it a political <laughs> one. <laughs> 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 nobody nobody mentioned it. With all due respect, it was made political about half an hour ago. Martin uh, and the debate well, was, sure, allowed, but... was allowed to ramble on and on. We're part of the UK, Philip. How, how, did, how did it become oh, political? Hold on a minute, gentlemen. Can we stay political. focused on consumer part, issues here, please? Part of the UK is, is, sorry, Gordon. I think it's important. Can we, can can we no, stay focused on consumer issues here, it's please? It's important that the people here and have the same rights in relation to consumerism, and that they. I think brief we, note. we fully welcome this. We fully welcome it. I think, regardless of people's background, they're, they're totally entitled to it, and uh, I do welcome the fact that. Um, Goods received. If received goods and digital content fit for purpose in service performed within reasonable care and have false rectified free of charge or refund or replacement provided, I think that's very positive. And uh, you talked about, for an example, of purchasing cars. Will this be in the second hand market? For it will indeed well? cover the second hand new market, everything that's sold by a businessman to a consumer. If 30 days. They have 30 days. Sorry, if the thing has a fault to start with, yeah, yeah. the businessman has an opportunity to repair it if he can do, and if not, then the consumer is within his rights to reject at that point. There may be some deduction for usage and things like that, but again, that's a matter of the particular circumstances. In relation to uh, a lot of businesses done with multinationals, companies, the supermarkets, for example, generally they have a good policy. I would think that the public are fairly satisfied with it. They bring a product back and it, it's changed without, without dispute in, in the main. Perhaps I'm no, that, that, the point. I, I, I would agree 100%. The, in many respects, the concept of giving money back and getting your money yes. back comes from people who were very effective in trading and made that quite a selling point years yeah. ago. If I recall rightly, you used to be able to bring pullovers back more or less forever. <laughs> My wife used to do it as a sort of a routine. Yes, yes. But the, uh, well, when the local choice. supplier perhaps needs to move on in, in that regard and needs to be maybe more flexible in relation to consumer rights. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that the local man is any different in many respects. An awful lot of them have been brought forward and have come in to recognise that. Um, perhaps the car trade maybe would be a slightly different one, but then that's for reasons to come back quite some time. Do you think this bit of legislation will, have, will make a difference to the ordinary man on the street? I think it'll help nobody else. To be quite honest, we've got some months. Thanks very much, Chair. Yeah. Thank you. And that's why we're here. So, Correct. Um, Remember that? Do you know women yeah. do any shopping about here? Sure. Can we move on then to Mr Douglas? Sammy. Uh, thank you, Chair. <coughs> the um, presentation this morning was very clear that the Consumer Council, the Northern Ireland Consumer Council, support this. Dennis and Jimmy have uh, totally convinced me, so I'm happy to go with it, Chair. That's grand. That's grand. OK, thanks very much indeed, gentlemen. In terms of the committee itself, we just have to make the decision now that we're content with the LCM and the process being followed through. So, um, put it to members, there seems to be a general mass of, of, of opinion in favour of that here today. Great. Well, Great. I'd like to hear from the Consumer Council to see what their view on it is, to see what's actually missing from this bill. Well, I'll tell you what we can get. Um, I'm sure we can get the response sent over that they provide. No, well, I, pre I presume 
I'd like to hear from the Consumer Council to ask him directly, because I, I asked Jimmy, and, and I think he wanted to answer, but he can't answer. No, 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 I, no, no hold on a minute, Phil, to be respectful here to Jimmy. Um, if you put a question to Jimmy, I know from previous experience he'll answer it. Uh, so, um, do you want to put the question to him? I, I did, and I'm not, I'm not going to force the issue, but um, I think there, there are some people in our community that are, are very well versed and experienced in consumer affairs. And I'd like to hear from them to see what is missing from this um, consumer rights bill to see um, what could be added to it. And if we hear directly from the experts um, that there's nothing missing from this bill, that it's the perfect bill, that if we were to bring in a local bill, it couldn't be any better than that, then I'm happy to support it. Right. Hold on a minute. Yes, Paul. Chair, on that, nobody, nobody's suggesting that everything and anything is perfect and that everything and anything is in this bill. This is just... We're using Westminster to tie up all of those sins, to converge all these issues into one bill, which would tidy it up. If we do feel, as an assembly, as a democratic constitution, that we need to do an institution that we need to do more, then we can do that. We are not losing that right to do that. Isn't that correct? That is yep. correct. Do you want to comment on that, please, Jeff? That is correct, and I would also put that this is a very technical bill in terms of consumer legislation and law, and the experts. In consumer law, and are, are actually in this room, and trading standards in Northern Ireland are the experts in Seller Goods Act. Uh, certainly not taken away from the fact that the Consumer Council have a view to represent the consumers and, 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 main, and have input into this process, but the expertise which exists in terms of the technical aspects of the Seller Goods Act and other acts and law commensurate, commensurate to it does not lie within the Consumer Council. Okay, um, sure. can, I, can I just quickly? Very briefly, sir. Sure. Read the delay. It says, I'm reading here, Jimmy, it says, the delay would disadvantage consumers if we keep delay. Delay is going to disadvantage consumers instead right. of helping consumers. Uh, so I, I think we should not be delayed. <coughs> but, <coughs> excuse me, I'm happy enough to get a written opinion from the Consumer Council as to what they feel are the issues with this. And I'm sure uh, four or five days of a delay one way or another is not going to uh, impact upon this. In a major or meaningful way. So, I'm sorry, can we have that specific yeah. question? What delay? What will delay mean? I mean, I'm talking about uh, any delay is not helpful. But if we if we were talking about a completely new uh, debate to have a Northern Ireland in legislation, no, 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 delay, no, the delay in terms of seeking a vote no, from consumer the council. Only, the only thing is, and it, it is a fair point, yes. just to get clarity around what the consumer council's views yes. have been on. Uh, that's the only delay. I personally, I'm, I'm the chairman speaking as a member here. I don't have a wild problem with it uh, going ahead and going through that process, and I think that's the general feeling of the committee, just to get ourselves as in best informed as we possibly can. Yeah. So, uh, sir, could you just check in? Uh, well, what's the process? Um, this response comes back from the Northern Ireland Consumer Council. Yes. Does that go to all of us then? Oh, yes. And then we have a number uh -huh. to say about If they say we're grand with this, okay. that's okay. So. so, Sorry, on my specific question, what will a delay, even of a week, right. mean? We can we can handle a, a, a week or slightly more if necessary. I think basically, you know, it's 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 within a process in Westminster at the moment, right. and there will be critical deadlines in the months coming forward up till uh, May June time. But obviously, we need to get right. our end sorted <clears throat> to feed into that. Okay, right. Can this but back then, committee next week. Yep, back to us next week. That's it. Just for yes. information, this is going through the committee in Westminster, and they're expected to produce a report on the 13th of March. Mm -hmm. so there's no major urgency that a week or a fortnight will do any major damage here. No, no, that's my point. The committee, the committee has the right to sit in those. Okay, so, so we're agreed in that course of action. Of here. It's not and, your heart, um, Michael Gordon. And again, uh, so I think we have come to the conclusion that, again, thank you very, very much for your time and uh, your efforts both, both here and elsewhere. Thank, thank you. you. Thank <coughs> Now, um, agenda item number six then, matters arising, mm -hmm. papers for this are included oh, there. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to need you to come up here and keep you under the reins of keeping yourself under the reins as well as Vice Chair. <laughs> Gordon, I'll keep you right, my will okay. Gordon, I'll keep you right. So, I have this matters arising there, so I can take the thing down. I'm going to need you to go to up the stairs, so... <clears throat> Thanks very much for that.
Members, we move on to agenda item six. Uh, matters arising. Uh, papers for this item are page 109. Um, at page 110 is a letter to, of thanks uh, to the committee from the Irish League of Credit Unions for tabling the motion of support financial assistance to credit unions. And tabled today is a letter from the Ulster Federation of Credit Unions endorsing the committee's motion. Members to content to note both those letters. Yeah. Remind yeah. members that the motion on financial support for credit unions is scheduled for debate on Tuesday next, the 25th of February, and tabled today is a draft press release on the motion. Members content with the draft press release for issue? Chair, what, what, what numbers are that? Where are that? Table. The press table. release table. Table. I wouldn't get that in there. Page 28 of table papers. Tend to note. Yeah, great. Um, at page 111 of your packs, you'll find the financial capability strategy and the action plan. Um, the committee considered the matter at a meeting on the 6th of February and agreed to receive details of responses to the consultation. And included is a summary of the consultation responses at page 210. Um, are members content um, with the financial capability strategy? Great. Uh, inform members that um, a response from the department to a committee query on collaborative research and development programmes is at page 226. Are members content to note? Right. At last week's meeting, it was agreed to consider um, an engagement with the Iraqis Joint Committee on Jobs, Enterprise and Innovation, and we had agreed that relevant topics for discussion should include cross border collaborative research, including Horizon 2020, Inter Trade Ireland, including statistics on trade, innovation and business development, and the Inter Trade Ireland budget. The Border Region Economy, including the Bradley Report on Cross-Border Economic Renewal and the potential for Cross-Border Economic Development Zones, and then the drawdown of European funding. Are members content to note? Chair, sure, what, what chair are we on there? There's no papers on it. Ah, there's no papers on it. Gordon, it's just a, a reminder of what we previously agreed, because there was some confusion last week, I think. Right. And this is, we'll have this meeting. Where is this meeting going to be? I think or this not? one, it's here. It's here. Here, yeah. right. Have we got a date for it? No, uh, not as yet. Members recall that at last week's meeting, uh, there was correspondence from the clerk to that committee saying that the committee needed to update themselves on some of the aspects of what this committee wanted to discuss before they would arrange a date to meet the committee. Enterprise Ireland, are they involved in the third chair? No, no it would be, no, be just the committee members, and we'd maybe discuss Inter Trade Ireland. I think it was one of the agreed options. We hear a lot about Enterprise Ireland, who? Good. They're supposed to be. It's just be yeah. interesting to get an input from them. I think Chair, the committee agreed last uh, week's meeting to receive a briefing from uh, Enterprise Ireland. Okay, great. So thanks. in motion. Yeah. Um, at, at last week's meeting, members agreed to ask the department for an update meeting uh, following a meeting with the RBS chief executive. Um, the department has informed the committee office that the minister's meeting with Ulster Bank representatives today, and that the first minister, the deputy first minister, and the minister for finance and personnel met with the RBS chair and Ulster Bank chief executive Jim Brown to focus on the RBS review of the Ulster Bank. Um, and I think we agreed last week that we'd get a, a briefing from a written briefing from the department on on those meetings. Um, are members content to note? Yes, well, we have those well, for next week, all been well. Chair, I think we all have been uh, contacted by constituents yeah. concerned about this. I'm sure, yeah. and we are interested. We'll be keen to get that possibly next week. 
So, well, Chair, I put it on the, the information to the DALO that the committee requires this uh, response urgently, if possible. Yeah, thank Thanks you. Too. Agenda item number seven, um, a written briefing from Assembly Research on the provisions <laughs> contained in the EU Tobacco Directives, or the EU Tobacco Product Directive, and papers of this item were page 227. The committee considered correspondence on the EU plans to revise the Tobacco Products Directive. Members agreed to commission research on the directive and on trends in tobacco. Um, included in the papers is the research paper outlining the provisions in the directive. The members, any comments or the content to note? Noted. Yeah, can I just say uh, on this subject, uh, whilst uh, I, I find smoking abhorrent, and uh, I have never <laughs> smoked in my life, uh, very disappointed if any of my family did smoke, uh, there are two issues here. Uh, there, there, I have absolutely no problems with states, governments and any other health body trying to reduce the amount of people who smoke. Uh, the question I have is, are these regulations from Europe going to achieve that? And my answer to that, as I've looked at it, is no. But what it could well do is affect jobs in Northern Ireland and in particular my constituency in Northampton. If you're gonna if people's gonna bring forward proposals that ban smoking in places like pubs, bars or even cars, I would be very much in support. But when you actually start to uh, affect conveyor belts where people actually work at, which will have no real health effects on the world's population, and them jobs are based in Northern Ireland. I take great exception, uh, and I think the EU needs to take a step back and actually consider what they're doing, and ask the simple question, will this reduce smoking? Because if you have horrific images on cigarette packs, and it still hasn't made people stop smoking, what will plain packaging do, and what will... Uh, larger packs of cigarettes do, or smaller packs of cigarettes do, or larger, heavier pouches of tobacco do, that will not reduce smoking. Uh, that will just put jobs in jeopardy. And I think, uh, I, I certainly am fighting tooth and nail against the European Commission's uh, plans and rules uh, in, in relation <coughs> to this. Any other members want to comment? This is primarily a matter that's been dealt with the Health Committee, Gordon, is it? <coughs> Yeah, will be, yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. yeah. We can tend to note the, the research yeah, paper. Sorry, the other one was out in the Tobacco Retailers Bill was, was dealt oh. with this week. Okay. Yeah. Um, moving on to agenda item number eight, um, the Barroso Task Force Desk Officers Report from October to December 2013. Papers for this item are at page 254. And included in your papers are quarterly reports from the four desk officers and two briefing documents produced by the Social Cohesion Desk Officer. Um, I'd like to remind members that the committee agreed to consider a timeline for its request for information on the desk officer's activity at this week's meeting. And a summary of the committee's request is tabled today. Are members, have members any comments or are they content to note? Agenda item number nine, nine correspondence. Papers for this are page 291. Um, an invitation from the department to members to attend a public consultation event on enabling success and new strategic framework to tackle economic inactivity is at page 292. Um, if any member wants to attend, can they contact the committee office? Um, the correspondence from the Committee for Agriculture and Rural Development regarding the Agri-Food Loan Scheme. Are members content for the Department to copy its response to this committee? Great. Great. From the Committee for the for OFM DFM regarding the drawdown of EU funds for the last three years at page 296. Are members content to receive a breakdown from the Department of how this funding was used in each of the last three years? Great. 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 Yeah. From the Minister regarding consultation on EU regulation on the rights of passengers in bus and coach transport at page 308. Um, DETI will have some enforcement responsibility through trading standard service, however the Department considers this to be minimal. Are members content to note? Great. Great. Um, there's a response from the Minister to the Committee for Employment and Learning regarding its inquiry into post-special post, um, education provision at page 309. Are members content to note? Great. Um, table today is correspondence from the Committee for Finance and Personnel regarding sickness absence in the public sector. It includes a report on the wider public sector, and part one of the report is tabled. The rest of the report, which refers to the education and health sectors, is available from the Committee Office if members um, want to view it. Members content to ask the Department for its views on the parts of the report that relate to DETI. 
Great. Great. Uh, table today is an invitation to an NIABT event in the Long Gallery on Tuesday the 11th of March at 4 o'clock, featuring a, a briefing from Interest Rate Ireland. Can any members interested in attending contact the committee office? Um, agenda item 10, any other business? Um, there are no tabled um, additional items of business. Have members any additional items of business? Um, Chair, um, uh -huh. I'll chat to you during the week there. I think you said you could speak to the Minister about his deficit. No, I, I raised it here um, about a fortnight ago, the bid mission with Invest and I. Mm -hmm. I think Sammy's looking for an update on it, just. Well, it's just I, I think they, they had contacted us and said that anybody wanted to go, but it was yeah. May, and I think you said it's May put off to September, is that mm -hmm. Yeah, the member, uh, the committee agreed last week that I, I think that it suggests that it would prefer uh, to have a be involved in a proper trade mission where it thought it could do some some good rather than, uh, than going on something that was specifically organised. Okay. I agree with that. Uh, but it was roughly yeah. September time they were planning now, isn't it? Well, the autumn times oh, have right, been okay. suggested. Thank you, Chair. Um, agenda item number 11, the date. Chair, I have right. one issue. Just the, we uh, have invest in I am here on a regular basis and uh, we seem to have an awful lot of staff involved and an awful lot of issues and the huge structure there in place. Would it be possible for us to have more engagement with them, maybe on an informal basis with Invest as members here, to get more information on what they are doing and how we can pass it out to our constituents? Would that be possible to arrange something along those lines? I know we did try it some time ago and perhaps we went the wrong way about it. <laughs> and wasn't fully successful. But I do think it is. it's a huge organisation. There are huge resources there when you look at where they're, they're scattered all over the world. And I think we meet them here once a quarter or whatever, formally. But I think if there's some more informal contact with them, something we could maybe build on. Maybe you could consider that, Chairman. Uh, Jim informs me that um, Invest and I have provided a, a contact for an individual within the organisation, specifically for members of this committee, um, to contact on an informal basis. And Jim says he'll get that circulated around members again. Was that a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, well, with all due respect, that's not where I'm coming from. Okay. You know, I'm in contact with Invest and we have our regional managers who we can all talk to, and we do. But it's just, you know, there's a, there's a lot of extra. Who's it you'd like to speak to, Gordon? Or is it different people? Well, I think even on the export side there, the export side, boost and business, all those people, the loan funds, there's so much there, and I think we have a responsibility to try and get those issues out to the people. And are we well enough informed? And that's all what I'm, I'm after. Whether we can have a, an informal session in the Long Gallery, think about who we want to ask. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, yeah, Chair, uh, Deputy Chair. Yeah, the, Gordon has a good point there. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be something that we do in the future around uh, those table discussions. Yeah. yeah. Around table discussions where we could invite the regional managers alongside some of the <coughs> local companies that, that are within their regional mm -hmm. area and, and get a table discussions going and, and just even a networking session. Mm -hmm. doesn't even have to be on a basis, but. That's something as a structure we could maybe look at. Well, uh, are we happy enough to for the the team here to contact Invest and I see if they could organise an informal session, maybe for members to go down to Invest and I to yes, engage them. Uh, yeah. Then uh, Invest and I also organise. It's either an annual or, or a biannual event for all their overseas staff as well. Yes, and it might be appropriate for the next time they have one of them for committee members to be invited. Yeah, yeah, that's a possibility. But you know, even. Up here, we're, yeah. we're good at events up here. We seem to have a lot of stuff ongoing and your business trust thing, whether you want to do it through that or whatever. But you know, we'll leave a gym see what he can try and develop more informal links with Invest NI yeah. between them and, and us as elected representatives that we are free and we're to the information and we're able to freely pass it out to those that need it. Okay. We represent. Thanks, Chair. You're very helpful. And you put me up here on a different man, Gordon. Date, date, time and place of the next meeting. The next meeting of this committee will be on Thursday the 27th of February in room 30 um, of the Buildings at 10am. Yeah, there you are. We're now going to move this into the we'll keep closed session to deal with the review and electricity policy. 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.